And hello, and welcome back to another installment of our reading of Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon by Dave McGowan. Rest in peace. And I'm your host here on PNR Radio. Unplug them, Jack. How's everyone doing tonight? We hope that everybody's feeling real groovy and in the mood for Chapter 11 Detours Rustic Canyon and Greystone Park. And again, for those who are just uh, now joining us and are new to these readings, highly recommend that you look into David McGowan's work also uh, programmed to kill if you look him up uh, you can uh, find his books available for purchase weird scenes inside the canyon is the one that we're reading right now it's an excellent book looking uh, peeping behind the veil going down into the rabbit hole that produced some of the 60s, 70s, and beyond rock, rock, rock icons who helped to define and shape the counterculture movement. And it appears that they weren't as counterculture as we thought they were. So now we're going to take a little slight detour from Laurel Canyon, California, and we're going to check out Rustic Canyon in Greystone Park. Rustic Canyon, circa the 1960s. Greystone Park. And shout out to everyone who is joining in on the fast. <clears throat> Uh, I, will be, I will be focusing on Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 through 8. Fasting for uh, increased clarity And vision and precision in hearing from the Lord. Increased clarity, increased vision, and precision in hearing from the Lord. So now let's get into our reading. Now that we have some, at least some, um, visible reference of where we're going to be going up into the Santa Monica Canyons. So let's get started. Without further ado, again, if you're reading along with us, chapter 11, chapter 11, you ready? Sister Lisa's here, Melody's Child and Key. Ladarian is here, Christy H. T. J. Misha, Mil Misha Williams, Basil Chips, S. Kane is in the house, good to see you, glad you made one, the time stamp champ, Keturah Israel, Dave Palmer, McGilla Gorilla Ape, and everyone else, if I missed you, I'm not trying to dish you, but let's get into it, oh, and Dr. Dave, Dr. Dave is in the house, a long time family member. Dr. Dave's Pinball Restorations. All right, let's get to it. Chapter 11. By the time Manson shifted base from Rustic Canyon to an old ranch in Chatsworth, he'd begun formulating the notion that he and his followers had to prepare themselves for a race war with black America and that's from Barney Hoiskins, writing in Hotel California, the book. Another good read that we'll have to look into. 
Now we must now temporarily relocate to Rustic Canyon, which lies about nine miles west of Laurel Canyon in the Hollywood Hills. It was there, in Lower Rustic Canyon, that beach boy Dennis Wilson lived, and in the late 1960s, in what Stephen Gaines described in Heroes and Villains as a palatial log cabin style house at 14400 Sunset Boulevard that had once belonged to humorist Will Rogers. The expansive home sat on three lushly landscaped acres. In the summer of 1968, as is fairly well known, Charlie Manson and various members of his entourage moved in with Wilson. That's right, for those who are just now hearing this, it's come out, it's well known, fact that um, Charles Manson had a friendship, prior relationship with one of the beach boys. And I remember just growing up looking at the images of beach bo- of the beach boys. And again, this was before my time. That would have been people my, my parents' age, or my mother's age would have listened to. But they had such a clean cut persona. Again, we know that's all crafted. That imagery is crafted by the industry. We know that today. But as children, you don't know that. And then you come to find out about Charles Manson as you get a little older, and he has the total opposite image. Not clean cut. (laughs) Not goody two-shoes. And you just wonder, what would light have anything to do with darkness? Or why would the Beach Boy have anything to do with Charlie Manson? And it comes to find out they're all part of this Laurel Canyon Collective. So as so in the summer of 1968, as is fairly well known, Charlie Manson and various members of his entourage moved in with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. Considerably less well known is that Charles Tex Watson, for reasons that have never really been explained, was already living there. As many as two dozen members of Manson's clan spent the entire summer there with Wilson from the Beach Boys picking up the tab for all expenses. The Mansonites, mostly nubile young women, regularly drove Wilson's expensive cars and demolished at least one of them. Dennis didn't seem to mind. He was busy recording Manson in Brother Brian's home studio and inviting fellow musicians like Neil Young over to the house to hear Charlie Manson perform. Young was so impressed with Charles Manson's performances that he urged Mo Austin to sign him. So just for the benefit of our youngest viewers that are watching who don't know what a Beach Boy looked like, and sadly enough, may not know what Charles Manson looks like. Charles Manson is such a noted villain in American history. And by now, you've seen him in a meme or something. Nieces and nephews. A notorious, well, it, it's a whole other st- study to talk about Charles Manson um, and whether or not he is what they say that he is. But Charles Manson is said to be one of the most notorious cult leaders of all time, uh, reportedly the mastermind behind the uh, murder of um, uh, Tate, uh, Roman Polanski's wife. And, it, you know, what's notable about him is that it's widely believed that he didn't do the killings himself as much as he ordered others to do them so they talk about his ability to manipulate and mind control others well it appears again from the work of Dave McGowan whose book we're reading now and a lot of others it appears that Charles Manson himself was likely a uh, intelligence agency operative who was under some form 
of MK Ultra or MK Ultra like brainwashing. And they said it about a lot of the assassins and uh, serial killers alike throughout history. Many of them can be connected to intelligence agencies and or brotherhoods, secret societies. Pastor Joe Schimmel of Good Fight Ministries did an excellent section on that, believe it or not, within his documentary, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. Classic documentary, inspirational to my work. And within that documentary, he had an entire section where he showed you how many of the uh, noted serial killers, uh, John Wayne Gacy, Berkowitz, Son of Sam, um, and others were connected to organizations and groups and uh, brotherhoods um, such as the Process Church and others. And so Charles Manson is not the first to do what he did, but he is American pop culture holds him up in high esteem as they do many serial killers, uh, uh, so-called serial killers and cult leaders. It's part of the programming, part of the problem reaction solution programming, and also part of the duality and duping delight programming living here where Luciferians get off on this hermetic magic, flipping things, making evil fair seeming, making a villain a hero and a hero a villain. It's commonplace. Now we have the, the um, Beach Boys. Surfing, surfing, and all that type of, uh, get around, get around, I get around, yeah, get around, ooh, I get around, I get around, I get around. No, not Tupac can breed. Or, uh, uh Tupac and Digital Underground, my bad. And, um, uh, surfing, surfing USA and all that type of stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> a really uh, bleached sound uh, the official website for the inventors of the California sound is what they would call it but like the surfer sound an image gotta see the images <laughs> <laughs> how cool cool dudes cool but yes, um, they get off, off off of putting things in front of your face. <clears throat> Pardon me. That you can make the connections to. Just logically, you can make the connections and say, well, wait a minute. Something's off about this. And they get a delight out of frustrating you and confusing you in that manner. That's one of the ways that they get duping delight. But anyway... That's the Beach Boys for those who don't know. I know I know Big Nephew Ronell rocks out to the Beach Boys, so he was already hit. But that was for the other brothers and sisters in here who might have missed the the uh, uh, wonderful, soulful sounds of the Beach Boys. All right, let's move on. Slick Firmament. <laughs> he said, Beach Boy sponsored by Clorox. <laughs> oh boy, somebody's really mad. Okay, let's move on. The Beach Boys, produced by Barry White. Get in there and sing that song with some soul. Oh, excuse me. All right, Dennis would later claim that he had destroyed all the Manson demo tapes. Wow, that he remembered almost nothing of his time with Charlie and the family. How much would a Charles Manson demo tape be worth at a black market auction with a bunch of millionaires and shakes and imams sitting around there and Dubai billionaires? Perfect soundtrack to a snuff film. Uh, Dennis would later claim that he had destroyed all the Manson demo tapes, that he remembered almost nothing of his time with Charlie and the family, and that he certainly knew nothing about the Tate and LaBianca murders, 
which were committed in the summer of 1969, about a year after the family had vacated the Rustic Canyon residence. At some point in time, though, Wilson of the Beach Boys had a change of heart and decided that maybe he did indeed know a little something about the murders. Quote, I know why Charles Manson did what he did, unquote, said Dennis. Quote, Someday I'll tell the world. I'll write a book and explain why he did it. Unquote. Close quote. Close quote. That book, however, was never written in Wilson's story if indeed he had one, was never told. Instead, Dennis Wilson drowned under questionable circumstances on December 28, 1983, in the marina where his beloved yacht had previously been docked. They like to do these offings in and around Saturnalia and other quote-unquote high-power spiritual days. But this story isn't really about Dennis Wilson. It's about Charlie Manson and his alleged motive for allegedly ordering the Tate and LaBianca murders. According to the Helter Skelter scenario popularized by lead prosecutor Vincent Buglioso, Buglioso, who later penned a wildly disinformational book on the JFK assassination. So according to this dubious fellow, Manson was hoping to spark an apocalyptic race war. It is said that Charlie believed that America's black population would prevail over whitey, but that having won the war, the victors would be incapable of governing themselves. And that, alas, is when Charlie and his retinue would emerge from the shadows to take command. Yes. According to Barney Hoiskins, Manson began formulating his race war theory during his stay in Rustic Canyon. If true, then Charlie appears to have been following in the footsteps of a long-forgotten former Rustic Canyon guru, one who preceded him by a few decades, and who, like Manson, had a certain fondness for swastikas. Just to the north of Dennis Wilson's former home is a vast wilderness of underdeveloped canyon lands. Lower Rustic Canyon soon gives way to Upper Rustic Canyon, and all signs of human civilization abruptly vanish. The land remains wild and undeveloped, save for an old unpaved fire road that winds along the summit between Rustic Canyon and a neighboring canyon. That road is closed to the public and vehicle traffic is non-existent. Aside from an occasional hiker wandering in from nearby Will Rogers State Park, there's nary a human to be seen. The farther in one hikes, the more wild and untamed it becomes. Along with the sights of the city, the sounds and the scents quickly disappear as well. Within a very short time, it is surprisingly easy to forget that one is still within the confines of the city of Los Angeles. And in its fall splendor, the canyon looks nothing like the Los Angeles that most Angelinos know and don't quite love. It is beautiful, serene, pastoral, and yet Filled with mist and heavily overgrown, it is also vaguely ominous. If one knows where to look, there is a narrow concrete stairway that is accessible from the fire road. That stairway descends down to the floor of the canyon and is a very, very long descent. 512 steps long to be exact as one makes the descent this stairway which seems to go on forever seems wildly out of place with time to kill on the way down one may find oneself pondering how many man hours it took to set forms for 512 poured concrete steps 
and how truckloads of concrete were poured out here in the middle of nowhere. Reaching the canyon floor, one finds that though the native flora has struggled to mightily reaching the canyon floor, one finds that though the native flora has struggled mightily to reclaim the land, remnants of a past civilization can be seen everywhere. Some structures remain largely intact. A nearly 400,000 gallon spring-fed reservoir serving a sophisticated potable water system, a concrete walled structure that once housed twin electrical generators capable of lighting a small town, more concrete stairways, hundreds of steps long, each snaking its way up the canyon walls, weathered livestock stables, professionally graded and paved roads, countless stone retaining walls, an incinerator, concrete foundations, and skeletal remains of, formal, of former dwellings. The rusting carcass of a Manson-esque VW bus. And at the former entrance, an imposing set of electronically controlled wrought iron security gates. It's the kind of place that seems tailor-made for Charlie and his family. And probably was. It, it's the kind of place that seems tailor-made for Charlie and his family, remote and secluded, yet accessible by the family's custom-built dune buggies with just enough crumbling infrastructure to provide rudimentary shelter for the clan and with elaborate security provisions, including sentry positions and a formerly electrified fence completely encircling the 50-acre compound, as well as, by some reports, an underground tunnel complex would be shot. That would be... That would be on brand. <laughs> With the Illuminati. <laughs> and it was located just a short hike up the canyon from the place that Charlie Manson called home in the summer of 1968. While exploring this place, obvious questions begin to come to mind. Who developed this remote portion of the canyon in what feels like the middle of nowhere? The goal appears to have been to create a hidden and completely self-sustaining community and an extraordinary amount of money was invested in infrastructure development, but why? And of course, they would have us to believe that Manson and them just stumbled up on this place. That's what they would have us believe. Rustic Canyon, Rustic Canyon Trail. Will Rogers State Park. Creepers. I want to be up in them thar heels. Anyway, okay, let's get back to it. And do it till we through it. Do it like we used to it. All right. Very few Angelinos know of the curious ruins in Rustic Canyon, and fewer still know the history of those ruins. Every now and then, though, a local reporter will pay a visit and the story will make a one-time appearance in a local publication. Briefly casting some light on a bit of the hidden history of Los Angeles. I wonder, do they talk about the reptilian city that was up under there? Oh, I didn't say that. In May 1992, Mark Norman of the Los Angeles Business Journal was one such reporter. According to Norman, county records show Jesse Murphy, a widow, purchasing 50-plus acres north of Will Rogers' property in 1933. Bing! But the owners were actually named Stevens. Norman, 
an engineer with silver mining interests, and Winona, the daughter of an industrialist and a woman given to things supernatural. What does that mean? She was a little witchy. Giving a little witch. Local lore has it that Winona fell under the spell of a certain unnamed gentleman and attracted to things witchy. This trio, along with unnamed others, began a 10-year construction program costing $4 million, starting with a water tank holding 375,000 gallons and a concrete diesel-powered generator station with foot-thick walls, 12-inch thick walls, both of which are still visible. The hillsides were terraced for orchids. An electrified fence circled the boundaries, and a huge refrigerated locker was built into a hillside. The one thing Murphy Stevens couldn't seem to get right was their main house. The first architect hired was Welton Beckett, but there are also sketches by Lloyd Wright. And in 1941, Paul Williams drafted blueprints for a sprawling mansion with 22 duality bedrooms, a child's dining room, a gymnasium, pool, and a workshop in the basement. Thirteen years later, in September 2005, Cecilia Rasmussen of the Los Angeles Times added a few details to the story. Quote, Southern California has been the cradle to many odd cults, credos, utopias, and dystopias. Among the most mysterious are the ruins of a rustic canyon enclave, once known as Murphy Ranch. On rustic canyon's secluded and woodsy floor stand, the eerie on Rustic Canyon's secluded and woodsy floor stand the eerily burned out and graffiti scarred remains of concrete and steel structures, underground tunnels, and stairways leading from the top of the canyon to the bottom. Behind the locked and rusted wrought iron entrance gates and flagstone wall stand the traces of a small community that had the capacity to grow its own food, generate its own electricity, and dam its own water. The hillsides were terraced with 3,000 nut, citrus fruit, and olive trees, and fitted with water pipes, sprinklers, and an elaborate greenhouse. A high barbed wire fence discouraged intruders, Research indicates that it could have been home to up to 40 local Nazis from about 1933 to 1945. Armed guards patrolled the canyon dressed in the uniform worn by silver shirts, a paramilitary group modeled after Hitler's brown shirts. A man known through oral histories only as Herr Schmidt supposedly ruled the place and claimed to possess metaphysical powers. Herr Schmidt, yes, a man known through oral histories only as Mr. Schmidt, supposedly ruled the place and claimed to possess metaphysical powers. Herr Schmidt, needless to say, was the gentleman whose spell Winona Stevens fell under. According to Mark Norman, Schmidt convinced her that the coming world war would be won by Germany, that the United States would collapse into years of violent anarchy, and that the chosen few, read the Stevenses, the certain gentlemen, and other true believers, would need, to type, would need a tight spot in which to hold up, self-sufficient, until the firestorm had passed. Then they could emerge, not only intact, but thanks to the superiority of their politics, rulers of the ant hill, and not incidentally, the origin of its new population. Sound familiar? Murphy Ranch also reportedly featured a 20,000 gallon diesel fuel tank, livestock stables, and dairy and butchering facilities. Along both sides of the compound rise eight 
crumbling narrow stairways of at least 500 steps each. As the LA Times noted, those stairways apparently led to sentry positions high on the canyon walls. For the record, they are not actually crumbling, though most are overgrown with impenetrable vegetation. During Murphy Ranch's years of operation, nearby residents reportedly complained of late night military exercises and the sounds of live gunfire echoing through the canyons. To summarize then, it appears that the city of Los Angeles was home to a very secret, militarized Nazi compound that was in operation both before and during World War II Remnants of that blacked out chapter of L.A. history can be seen to this day, though few make the trek. I'd actually like to see that. When I visit California, I'm going to have to check that out. Pray over it. Bind up them demons. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. The purpose of the decaying compound was to ride out an anarchic, apocalyptic war so that the chosen few could emerge as the rulers of the new world. It was also very Manson-esque, and ironically enough, Manson and his crew spent an entire summer camped out at a home that was within a two-mile hike of this curious place. In the late 1940s, after the close of the war, Murphy Ranch was reportedly converted into an artist's colony. Architect Welton Beckett, who designed several of the structures at the ranch, would go on to design two of L.A.'s landmark structures. Of course, good masons getting more work. I'm sorry. The Capitol Records Building and the Music Center. In 1973, the property once known as Murphy Ranch was purchased by the city of Los Angeles. As far as is known, the city has no plans to reopen the facility. Murphy Ranch. I'm surprised Eddie didn't try to buy that. He heard too much about it. Let's see, Murphy Ranch. Yeah, old photos. Murphy Ranch Nazi camp. Murphy Ranch trail. Murphy Ranch old photos. Jeez Louise, hamburgers and fries. I cannot believe my eyes. Yes, it's yes, it's all graffitied out now. That's where the cool kids in the California hills go and tag dudes let's go up to Murphy Ranch and bomb yeah interesting okay let's continue with the menu Dude, it's spooky up there, man. Who's going up there? Bradley and Peyton. Brock. Van Cortland and Untermeyer functioned as outdoor meeting sites for the occult. Maury Terry, writing in The Ultimate Evil, in reference to the cult behind the Son of Sam murders, said, quote, Van Cortland and Untermeyer functioned as outdoor meeting sites for the cult. Nestled in between the mouths of Laurel and Coldwater Canyons, <laughs> 
Lisa Hartzik must be a little bit behind us. But yes, she's probably right. In today's climate, it's probably not politically correct to say beach boys, beach people, I think would keep you from getting canceled. Anyway, nestled in between the mouths of Laurel and Coldwater Canyons lies a large estate known as Greystone Park, home of the long vacant Greystone Mansion. What is anything like Grey Skull Castle? The home and the grounds it sits on is said to be, to this day, the most expensive private residence ever built in the city of Los Angeles. Hold on. We've got to see that, don't we? Let's have a reference from a mind. Grayskull Castle. He man. Goodness gracious. This looks like the house from um, Under the Silver Lake. This is the house that the songwriter lived in. (laughs) I have so many things. Okay, wow. Wow. Too much space for for one person, for one family, an, an entire community. I guess if your family's a community, that's where you'd live. Oh, there's the manor brings a true tale of family wealth and woe inside Greystone Mansion in Beverly Hills. Well, now, sprawling, sprawling. Oh yes. Ah, the good life. tormented afterlife constructed in the 1920s the home and grounds carried the then unfathomable price tag of four million dollars in the 20s by way of comparison the lookout end the lookout inn built a decade and a half earlier was projected to cost from 86,000 to 100,000 dollars in other words, the single family residence, that's what, that's what the Greystone Mansion is, that's a single family residence. If your single family's last name happens to be Rothschild, Bundy, or Astor, Rockefeller, something distinguished like that, sir. not Jenkins, no, certainly not a Jackson. <laughs> The massive, hold on. In other words, the single family residence cost at least 40 times what the lavish 70 room in cost. So this single family house cost 40 times what the lavish 70 room in, known as Lookout Inn, cost. And the inn required bringing infrastructure and building materials to a mountain that was remote. To a remote mountaintop. So with all of that, Castle Grace Gold still costs more. The massive forty-six thousand square foot edifice, and of course, Skeletor represents the skull and bones. The massive forty-six thousand square foot edifice sits amid 22 lavishly landscaped acres of prime Hollywood Hills real estate. And He-Man represents one of the Ashtar Command. It, it was from the New Age perspective of the New Agers being able to take down the Luciferians. New Agers who didn't know they were actually under the Luciferian belief system under the umbrella of New Age. That's why He-Man had that Ashtar Command look. He looked kind of like um, Apple White from the Heaven's Gate cult. You know that you know that haircut. <laughs> that Ashtar Command haircut, and that's why 
that's why there was this homoerotic undertone of it also because that's a big part of new age being fluid he man was very fluid Snarf. the massive 46,000 square foot edifice sits amid 22 lavishly landscaped acres of prime hollywood hills real estate this rather ostentatious home was built by uber wealthy oil tycoon edward l Duhenny. As a wedding present for his son, Edward Ned Doheny, Jr. If that plot line sounds vaguely familiar, it's probably because Edward Doheny was the inspiration for Upton Sinclair's oil, and thus for the homicidal Daniel Plainview, Plainview character in There Will Be Blood. Some of the interior shots near the end of that film of expansive marble-floored rooms appear to have been shot in the real Greystone manner. Upon the home's completion in September 1928, young Ned Duhenny and his new bride moved into the humble abode. Within months, the home would be blood-stained. Soon after, it would be permanently abandoned. Poor Ned, you see, was found dead in the cavernous home on February 16, 1929. Near him lay the lifeless body of his assistant slash personal secretary. For you guys listening back, just for the benefit of folks who are here in the live stream, let's just give it a minute. Okay, all right, we're back. Sorry about that. We were suffering buffering. Let's run it back a little taste. Poor Ned, you see, was found dead in the cavernous home on February 16th, 1929. Near him lay the lifeless body of his assistant slash personal secretary, Hugh Plunkett. Both men had been shot. Despite an, an inordinately long delay in reporting the deaths and an admission that the bodies had been moved prior to the arrival of police who were called only after the family doctor and numerous relatives, you know, that's how them rich folks do, all of whom arrived at the home before the LAPD. No formal inquest was ever conducted, and the case was written off in less than 48 hours as a murder-slash-suicide arising from a gay lover's quarrel. It's a good way to wrap it up. Put a nice bow around it. Nice California bow. Despite an unlikely lack of fingerprints on the gun, Plunkett was said to be the trigger man. And the media quickly went into a frenzy playing up the scandalous homosexuality and angle and portraying young Plunkett as positively demented. It is anyone's guess whether or not the two really were gay lovers. But it matters little. The rest of the story was almost certainly a work of fiction. In reality, both men were likely murdered as part of the massive cover-up and damage control operation that followed the disclosure of the Harding-era Teapot Dome scandal, which the Doheny family, as it turns out, was very deeply immersed in. Both Ned Doheny and Plunkett have been scheduled to testify before a Senate investigating committee, as was Doheny's father, one of the wealthiest men in the world at the time. Due to manufactured public sympathy for the grieving father, however, the congressional investigation was shelved. News reports of the tragedy contain no mention of the victim's deep involvement in the scandal and the tired murder-suicide scenario was trotted out because, as is seen so often in modern times, or as is seen so often in more modern times, if the alleged perpetrator is already dead, it pretty much eliminates the need for things like, I don't know, an investigation and trial. Some 40 years after those gunshots rang out in the opulent Greystone Mansion, a new Ned Doheny, scion of the very same Doheny oil clan, joined the ranks of the Laurel Canyon Singer-Songwriters Club. 
like fellow Canyonites Terry Melcher and Graham Parsons, Doheny was viewed by many as a pampered trust fund kid. Aw. Tiny violin. I'm playing the world's smallest, tiniest violin. His closest circle of friends included country rockers Jackson Brown, J.D. Souther. He should have just went on ahead and put the N at the end of his name. He's not fooling nobody with that subliminal. J.D. Souther. Never in my life have I seen the last name Souther. Well, see, I want people to know I'm representing the South and the Southern people. So, see, I just want to make my last name Southern, actually. But they told me to take the N off. J.D. Souther and Glenn Fry. In addition to recording his own solo albums, his self-titled debut was released in 1973. Doheny contributed to albums by such Laurel Canyon superstars as Frey, I mean as Fry, Glenn Fry, Jackson Brown, Don Henley, Linda Ronstadt, and Graham Nash. Strangely enough, New York City once had a large estate known as Greystone as well. That Greystone was donated to the city as Parkland, and it thereafter became known as Untermeyer Park, the same Untermeyer Park identified by Maury Terry as one of the two principal ritual sites used by the Process Faction behind the Son of Sam's murders. The other site was used the other site used by the cult was Van Cortland Park, named for Jacobus Van Cortland, a former mayor of New York and one of David Van Cortland's... Wow, hold on, slow down. The other site used by the cult was Van Cortland Park, named for, <laughs> named for Jacobus Van Cortland, a former mayor of New York and one of David Van Cortland Crosby's forefathers remember what John Todd said about Crosby another of Crosby's forefathers he's worse than Cosby another of Crosby's forefathers lent his name to Shoyla Road which happens to run along the western boundary of the Greystone estate in the Hollywood Hills I have no idea if anything I have no idea what, if anything, any of that means. But I thought it best that I toss it into the mix. And that's why we like your reading, Brother David. You're a man after my own heart. Sometimes you just got to toss it into the mix. I know y'all didn't ask for that He-Man aside. How we doing? Crosby wrote, I am, the wal I am the walrus for the Beatles. Thank you. And I've always heard that that was Satanic, su satanic Subliminal Central. That song. We've got uh, 260 people in here still listening along. Appreciate y'all. Billy's Child and Key said, good, good. So I guess that mean read, read. I remember Jessica would come to me with the book He'd be like, weed. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Jessica. <laughs> you must want to hear a Teddy Mite story. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it was kind of demanding. Okay. It was my baby sister. So I would weed. Here we go. Couldn't tell her no. Okay, Riders on the Storm, The Doors. Quote, By that I mean, get me a lead singer. He's got sort of an adrondulous, he's got sort of an, ah, tongue getting tight now. Let me take a sip. Let me take a sip.
wasn't exactly a sip, but my mouth was dry. Okay, <clears throat> chapter 12. Riders on the storm. Quote, by that I mean, get me a lead singer. He's got sort of an androgynous blonde hair. Very pretty. We need a guitar player. Sort of hatchet-faced. Wears a hat. Plays very fast, very dramatic. He must be very dramatic. Get me a pound of bass player, pound of drummer. They're making little cardboard cutouts. They hire a producer. They hire writers. And in the current stuff, they don't even bother getting people to play. Don't bother with that guitar player, bass player, drummer nonsense. The people in those bands can't write, play, or sing. Unquote. Who do you think that quote is by? Take a wild guess who said that. Tell them the formula. This, this is the formula. One more time. By that I mean, the quote starts, quote, by that I mean, get me a lead singer. He's got sort of an androgynous, he's got sort of an androgynous blonde hair, very pretty. We need a guitar player, sort of hatchet faced, wears a hat, plays very fast, very dramatic. He must be very dramatic. Get me a pound of bass player, pound of drummer. They're making little cardboard cutouts. They hire a producer, they hire writers. And in the current stuff now, they don't even bother getting people to play. Don't bother with that guitar player, bass player, drummer nonsense. The people in those bands can't write, play, or sing, unquote. David Crosby describing the synthetic manufactured nature of today's rock bands. David Crosby, the main himself. At the very beginning of this journey, it was noted that Jim Morrison's story was not in any way unique. Let's pull up Jim Morrison and the Doors. He's, he's notable enough. I know you guys saw Val Kilmer. Blah, 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 blah. Val Kilmer, right? Yeah, Val Kilmer's portrayal of Jim Morrison. You've seen Jim Morrison. Jay-Z sampled Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison in the Doors. There's Jim Morrison and his dad. Make America proud, son. And there he is. You've seen this picture of him. It's one of his most iconic pictures. Jim Morrison. All right. In the doors. Okay. So at the very beginning of this journey, it was noted that Jim Morrison's story was not in any way unique. That, however, is not exactly true. It is certainly true that Morrison's family background did not differ significantly from that of his musical peers, but in many other significant ways, Jim Morrison was indeed a most unique individual and quite possibly the unlikeliest rock star to ever stumble across a stage. And stumble is right. Boy had two left feet. Morrison essentially arrived on the scene as a fully developed rock star, complete with a backing band, a stage persona, and an impressive collection of songs. So he arrives on the scene with that? Enough, in fact, to fill the Doors' first few albums. How exactly he reinvented himself in such a radical manner remains something of a mystery since before his sudden incarnation as singer-songwriter, James Douglas Morrison had never shown the slightest interest in music. Are we shocked? Are we shocked? Yeah. He just had to look. And his dad had the assignment. He understood the assignment. 
wow never had shown the slightest interest in music none whatsoever he certainly never studied music and could neither read nor write it by his own account he never had much of an interest in even listening to music he told one interviewer that he never went to concerts quote one or two at most and before joining the doors he quote never did any singing I never even conceived of it unquote asked near the end of his life if he had ever had any desire to learn to play a musical instrument Jim responded quote not really unquote so here we had a guy who had never really sang who had never even conceived of the notion that he could open his mouth and make sounds come out So here we had a guy who had never sang, who had never even conceived of the notion that he could open his mouth and make sounds come out, who couldn't play an instrument and had no interest in learning such a skill, and who had never much listened to music or been anywhere near a band, even just to watch one perform. And yet he somehow emerged virtually overnight as a fully formed rock star who would quickly become an icon of his generation. Even more bizarrely, legend holds that he brought with him enough original songs to fill the first few Doors albums. They were pre-written for him. Wink. They sent him prepared. Uh, Morrison did not, you see, do as other singer-songwriters do and pin the songs over the course of the band's career. Well, no, that would require you to have to sit there in the studio in front of other musicians and fake like you can write a song. So they had him prepared. Morrison did not, you see, do as other singer-songwriters do and pin the songs over the course of the band's career. Instead, he allegedly wrote them all at once, before the band was even formed. As Jim once acknowledged in an interview, he was not a very prolific songwriter, quote unquote. This is the entire quote. Quote, not a very prolific, not a very prolific songwriter. Most of the songs I've written, I wrote in the very beginning about three years ago. I just had a period when I wrote a lot of songs. <laughs> Wrong answer. With When has that ever happened in the history of happening? In fact, all of the good songs that Morrison is credited with writing were written during that period, the period during which, according to rock legend, Jim spent most of his time hanging out on the rooftop of a Venice apartment building consuming copious amounts of LSD. This was just before he hooked up with fellow student Ray Manzarek, to form the doors. Legend also holds, strangely enough, that that chance meeting occurred on the beach. Though it seems far more likely that the pair would have actually met at UCLA, (laughs) where both attended the university's rather small and close-knit film school. In any event, The question that naturally arises, though it does not appear to have ever been asked of him, because, of course, when your uh, reputation is this wonky and unstable and can easily be discovered or or can easily be uh, tainted once folks find out that you're a plant, they have to make sure that you only interview with certain people. can't interview with some rando who's going to say something to you or ask something that's going to blow your cover. Let's read on. Uh, In any event, the question that naturally arises, though it does not appear to have ever been asked of him, is how exactly did Jim the Lizard King Morrison write that impressive batch of songs, if you want to call that impressive? I'm certainly no musician myself. Dave says, 
Uh, I'm certainly no musician myself, but it is my understanding that just about every singer-songwriter across the land composes his or her songs in essentially the same manner <laughs> on an instrument, usually either a piano or a guitar. Some songwriters I hear can compose on paper, but that requires a skill set that Jim did not possess. The problem, of course, is that he also could not play a musical instrument of any kind. How then did he write the songs? Wow. Wow. Dave McGowan is killing this. Okay. Wow. He would have had to have composed them, I'm guessing, in his head. That's possible. People do that. And I was wrong about Barry White. Barry White did play the piano. But, you know, when you hear produced by Barry White and you hear all of those funky sounds, who's playing the guitar? That's Who's playing the bass? Who's hitting that drum like that? We have no idea. Because I'm the maestro. I'm the one produced it. Okay, anyway, here we go. All right, I'm sorry. He would have had to have composed them, I'm guessing. Morrison would have had to have composed these songs, I'm guessing, in his head. So we are to believe then that a few dozen complete songs never heard by anyone and never played by any musician existed only in Jim Morrison's acid-addled brain. Anything is possible, I suppose, but even if we accept that premise, we are still left with some nagging questions, including the question of how those songs got out of Jim Morrison's head. As a general rule of thumb, if a songwriter doesn't know how to read and write music, he can play the song for someone who does and thereby create the sheet music, which was the case, for example, with all of the songs that Brian Wilson penned for the Beach Boys. But Jim, quite obviously, could not play his own songs. So did he, I don't know, maybe hum them. I used to come up with bass lines and guitar lines in my head. And I can't play a bass guitar or a rhythm guitar, but I knew how I wanted it to go. And I would do it with my mouth, sometimes humming, sometimes making whatever noise needed to be made for the musician to imitate it. And I said, no, that's not quite it. A little less wild, wilder. And we would shape a lot of music that way. So that is possible. But let's see. I can also sing Jim Morrison under the table. Uh, and these are, it should be clarified, songs that we are talking about here as opposed to just lyrics, which would be more accurately categorized as poems. Because Jim, as is fairly well known, was quite a prolific poet. Whereas he was a songwriter only for one brief period of his life. But why was that? Why did Morrison, with no previous interest in music, suddenly and inexplicably become a prolific songwriter only to just as suddenly and, inexplic and inexplicably lose interest after mentally pinning an impressive catalog of what would be regarded as rock and roll staples? And how and why did Jim achieve the accompanying physical transformation that changed him from a clean-cut, collegiate, and rather conservative-looking young man into the brooding sex symbol who would take the country by storm. And why, after a few years of adopting that persona, did Jim transform once again in the last year or so of his life into an overweight, heavily bearded, reclusive poet who seemed to have lost his interest in music just as suddenly and inexplicably as he had obtained it. If, if those devils behind closed doors consider you to be a pretty man, it's bad news blues. 
you ladies and and some of you fellas if you be 100 about it you remember fellas you'll remember it like this when you aspired to be in the type of shape that d'angelo was in for the how does it feel video i was doing push-ups like crazy during that time and then But see, again, once once you become a sex symbol to the masses, you're also a sex symbol to the devils behind closed doors who have very creepy, freaky appetites for sex and violence and perversion. That'll make you grow a beard and a beer belly. Let's move on. Made Andre 3000 want to walk around and play the flute at the airport. And God bless him. I'm glad he got out. Hope he don't never go back. Uh, let's continue. It wasn't just Morrison who was, in retrospect, a bit of an oddity. The entire band differed from other Laurel Canyon bands in a number of significant ways. As Vanity Fair once noted, the doors were always different. All four members of the group, for example, lacked previous band experience. Morrison and Manzarek, as noted, were film students, and drummer John Dinsmore and guitarist Robbie Krieger were recruited by Manzarek from his Transcendental Meditation class. Which is, I guess, where one goes to find musicians to fill out one's band. Well, you want to make sure that you and the dude have the right type of karma. That class, however, apparently lacked, and I know that's the wrong usage of the word karma, but that's how they would use it. That class, however, apparently lacked a bass player, so they did without. <laughs> except for those times when they used session musicians and then claimed that they did without. Anyway, the point is that none of the four members of the Doors had any real band credentials, even a band as contrived as the Birds, as we shall soon see, had members with band credentials. credentials. So too did Buffalo Springfield with Neil Young and Bruce Palmer, for example, having played in the Minor Birds, backing a young vocalist who would reinvent himself as Rick Super Freak James. I'm Rick James. I knew Rick was going to show up. Goldie McJohn of Steppenwolf, oddly enough, was a Minor Bird as well. The Mamas and the Papas were put together from elements of the Journeyman and the Mugwumps. And so on with the rest of the Laurel Canyon bands. The Doors could cite no such band lineage. They were just four guys who happened to come together to play the songs written by the singer who had never sung, but who had a sudden calling and a magical gift for songwriting. Oh. And as you would expect with four guys who had never actually played in a band before, they didn't really play very well. And that is kind of an understatement. Don't take my word for it, though. Let's let the band's producer, Paul Rothschild. Oh, see, there's no S in my Rothschild, you see. We're not, we're not related. And we don't mean for the profane to know it anyway. <clears throat> Paul Rothschild said, The Doors were not great live performers musically. Quote, the Doors were not great live performers musically. They were exciting theatrically and kinetically, but as musicians, they didn't make it. There was too much inconsistency. There was too much bad music. Robbie would be horrendously out of tune with Ray. John would be missing cues. There was bad mic usage too, where you couldn't hear Jim at all. Unquote. As fate would have it, 
I've heard some audio of a young and quite inebriated Jim Morrison at the microphone, and I would have to say that not being able to hear Jim at all might have, in many cases, actually improved the performance. But performing poorly as a live band, of course, did not really set the doors apart from its contemporaries. Another thing that was unusual about the band, however, is that from the moment the band was conceived, the lineup never changed. Yeah, now that's unusual. No one was added. No one was replaced. No one dropped out of the band over artistic differences or to pursue a solo career or to join another band. No, they were all pre-selected. They all understood the assignment or for any of the other reasons that bands routinely change shape. Didn't happen with them. It would be difficult to identify another Laurel Canyon band of any longevity that could make the same claim. After their first two albums, the Birds changed lineups with virtually every album release. Frank Zappa's Mothers of Invention were in a near constant state of flux. Love and Steppenwolf changed lineups on a regular basis with leaders John Kay and Arthur Lee routinely firing band members. Laurel Canyon's country rock bands were also constantly changing shape, usually by incestuously swapping members amongst themselves, so to speak, but not the Doors. Jim Morrison's band arrived on the scene as a fully formed entity with a name taken from Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. Interesting. Some of you may be familiar with Aldous Huxley. And with his other more commonly cited work, at least more commonly cited within the truther circles, And of course, that would be a brave new world. A brave new world. So when, we, when we're saying that term, when we use that reference, it comes from Aldous Huxley, who is the same writer who gives us the book Doors of Perception, which is where the doors get their name from. Something intelligence operatives and government implants would do. Let's continue. But not, okay, Jim Morrison's band arrived on the scene as a fully formed entity with a name taken from Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception, a stable lineup, a backlog of soon-to-be hit songs already prepared, and no previous experience writing, arranging, playing, or performing music. Other than that, though, they were just your run-of-the-mill, organic, grassroots, 1960s rock and roll band, dude. Albeit one with a curious aversion to political advocacy. Jim Morrison was, by virtually all accounts, a voracious reader. So why wouldn't he be into political advocacy? Former teachers and college professors expressed amazement at the breadth and depth of his knowledge on various topics and at the staggering array of literary sources that he could accurately cite. Of course, he's a well-educated son of a military admiral. I mean, of an, ar of an admiral. And yet, he was known to tell interviewers that he, quote, hadn't studied politics that much, really, close quote. But that was okay, according to drummer John Dinsmore, since, quote, a lot of people at our concerts, at least, they're sort of, it seems like they don't really come to hear us speak politics, unquote. That's the way it was in the 1960s, you see. The young folks of that era just didn't concern themselves much with politics and certainly didn't want their anti-war icons engaging in anything resembling polit political discourse, right? During the Doors' glory days on the Sunset Strip, Morrison struck up an intimate friendship with Whiskey-A-Go-Go owner Elmer Valentine, according to a Vanity Fair article published in September 2006. At the time, 
Valentine was also, coincidentally of course, very close to his own secretary slash booking agent, Gail Slopeman, whom Jim had known since kindergarten through naval officers' circles. Now, Valentine was also, by pretty much all accounts, including his own, a made man. Gangster Bookie? Valentine arrived in L.A. by way of Chicago, where he had worked as a vice cop. Oh, that's a good way to get into the gangster business. Uh, uh, this, <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> Valentine arrived in L.A. by way of Chicago, where he had worked as a vice cop, a decidedly corrupt vice cop. By his own account, he worked as a police captain's bag man, collecting the filthy lucre on behalf of the captain. He also boasted that even while working as a vice cop, his night job was, quote, running nightclubs for the outfit for gangsters, close quote. One very close friend from his days in Chicago was Felix Alderizio, also known as Milwaukee Phil, who was arguably the most feared hit man in the country in the 1950s and 1960s, carrying out at least 14 murders for Sam Giancana and other Chicago bosses. Valentine was ultimately indicted for extortion, though he naturally managed to avoid prosecution and conviction. Venturing out to L.A. circa 1960, he soon found himself running PJ's nightclub at the corner of Crescent Heights and Santa Monica Boulevards, which, as you may recall, was co-owned by Eddie Nash and was the favorite hangout of early rocker slash murder victim Bobby Fuller. It wasn't long, though, before Valentine had his very own club to run, the legendary Whiskey A Go Go, where numerous Laurel Canyon bands, including The Doors in the summer of 1966, served their residency. Valentine obviously had considerable financial backing to launch his business empire, and it wasn't much of a secret on the strip where that backing came from. Frank Zappa once cryptically referred to Valentine's backers as an ethnic organization, <laughs> while Chris Hillman of the Birds simply noted that, quote, whoever financed Elmer, I don't want to know, close quote. Valentine received far more than just financial backing to launch the Whiskey A Go Go. He got a generous assist from the media as well. As Vanity Fair noted, quote, within months of the Whiskey A Go Go's debut, Life Magazine had written it up. Jack Parr had broadcast it on an episode of his Post Tonight Weekly program from the club. Oh, he broadcast an episode of his program from the club and Steve McQueen and Jane Mansfield had installed themselves as regulars. Legendary actor McQueen, it should be noted, was a former U.S. Marine who had served in an elite unit tasked with protecting President Harry Truman's private yacht. Didn't know that. Turning now to the birds, Steve, Steve McQueen, good actor, great, great action movies. Check out Steve McQueen if you're not familiar with his movies. Anyway, turning now to the birds, the band that started the folk rock revolution, we find that they were, by any reasonable assessment, an entirely manufactured phenomenon. As a fledgling band, they had any number of problems. The first and most obvious was that the band's members did not own any musical instruments. That problem was solved, though, when Naomi Hershorn, better known for funding quasi-governmental projects such as the Hershorn Museum in Washington, D.C., stepped up to the plate to provide the band with instruments, amplifiers, and the like. But that didn't solve a bigger problem, which was that the band's members, with the notable exception of Jim McGuinn, didn't have a clue 
as to how to actually play those instruments. Of Jim later Roger McGuinn, right? Cast to play the bass, uh, pardon me, cast to play the role of the bass player <laughs> was Chris Hillman, who had never picked up a bass guitar in his life. As he candidly admitted years later, he was a mandolin player and didn't know how to play bass. But the other band members didn't know how to play their instruments either, so I didn't feel too bad about it. Unquote. On drums was Michael Clark, who had never before held a set of drumsticks in his hands, but who bore a resemblance to Rolling Stone Brian Jones, which was deemed to be of more significance than actual musical ability. As Crosby co-author Carl Gottlieb recalled, Clark had played beatnik bongos and conga drums, but had no experience with conventional drumming, which is a whole other animal. Splitting your body in four different rhythms. Whew. Much respect for those who can hit them drums. Richie Unterberger noted in Turn, 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 the book, that the guys in the birds had barely known each other before getting thrown into the studio. They were still learning electric instruments and in a couple of cases had never really even played their assigned instruments at all. Actually, Michael Clark didn't even have an instrument to start with. On his first rehearsals and even some recording sessions, he kept time on cardboard boxes. Gene Clark, however, Gene Clark, though, by far the most gifted songwriter in the band and a talented vocalist as well, could barely play his guitar and so was relegated to banging on the tambourine, which was Jim Morrison's and variously non-musically inclined members of the Project family's instrument of choice as well. <clears throat> David Crosby, tasked with rhythm guitar duties, wasn't much better. Crosby himself admitted in his first autobiography, does, any, does anyone really need to write more than one autobiography, by the way, that Roger was the, quote, that Roger was the only one who could really play. Close quote. The band had another problem. With the clear exception of Gene Clark, the group was a bit lacking in songwriting ability. To compensate, they initially played mostly covers, other people's songs. Fully a third of the band's first album consisted of covers of Bob Dylan songs, and nearly another third was made up of covers of songs by other folk singer-songwriters. Clark contributed five original songs, two of them co-written with McGuinn. As for Crosby, who emerged as the band's biggest star, his only contribution to the Bird's first album was backing vocals. Carl Franzoni perhaps summed it up best when he declared rather bluntly that, quote, the Bird's records were manufactured, close quote. Well, I mean, that is rather blunt, isn't it? I mean, you can't make it any plainer than that. The first album in particular was an entirely engineered affair. They don't mean like Recording and studio engineer, they mean manufactured, plant, industry, <clears throat> cookie cutter, created. Um, Carl Friends, oh, okay. The first album in particular was an entirely engineered affair created by taking a collection of songs by outside songwriters and having them performed by a group of nameless studio musicians. For the record, the actual musicians were Glenn Campbell on guitar, Hal Blaine on drums, Larry Natchel on bass, Leon Russell on electric piano, and Jerry Cole on rhythm guitar, after which the band's trademark vocal harmonies, entirely a studio creation, were added to the mix. As would be expected, 
The Birds' live performances, according to Bernie Hoiskin's Waiting for the Sun, weren't terribly good. But that didn't matter much. The band got a lot of assistance from the media, with Time Magazine being among the first to champion the new band. Oh, how, oh, what a good look. And they also got a tremendous assist from Vito and the Freaks, of course, and from the Young Turks, as previously discussed. The acting crew, uh, Dennis Hopper and them. We shall return to the birds and to the ubiquitous Vito Palikas in the next chapter. For now, I leave you with this curious little story about bird Chris Hillman's initial arrival in Laurel Canyon, as told by Michael Walker in the book Laurel Canyon. Quote. Okay, let's see. The Birds, Chris Hillman. So since we're going to end on this one, maybe we'll do another one, but let's bring him up. The Birds, Chris Hillman. Oops. Gonna have to take a small commercial break. Okay. Sorry about that. I lost my page. Okay, all right, got it back. Okay, so here we go. Bird's co-founder, Chris Hillman. Okay. In the autumn of 1964, a 19-year-old bluegrass adept and virtuoso mandolin player named Chris Hillman stood at the corner of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and Kirkwood Drive contemplating a for rent sign on a telephone pole across from the Canyon Country Store. It didn't take him long to find a place to stay and in the canyon's emerging mythos of enchanted serendipity one presented itself as if by magic. He says, quote, Hillman says, this guy drives up and he says, you looking for a place to rent? Hillman recalls. I said, yeah. And he said, well, follow me up. It was this young guy who was a dentist. It was his parents' house, a beautiful old wood house down a dirt road. And he lived on the top and he was renting out the bottom part. I just went, wow, perfect. The guy ended up being my dentist for a while. It was the top of the world, a beautiful, beautiful place. I had the best place in the canyon, close quote. In the 1960s, you see, it was quite common for a very wealthy person to offer exquisite living accommodations to a random scruffy vagrant. Dave is being facetious. We know this to be true sarcastic we know this to be true because it happened to charles manson on more than one occasion in any event chris hillman's former mountaintop home no longer exists because as tends to happen in laurel canyon it burned to the ground on what walker described as a hot witchy day in the 60s quote unquote according to hillman quote crosby was at my house an hour before the blaze i can't connect it yet where the satan factor came into play with david but i'm working on it close quote from hillman himself So 
So Hillman was on to the fact that something witchy was going on and Crosby had something to do with the witchiness and his house burning down. And Satan had something to do with it. That's what that means. Hillman was making that connection. So we can pretty much guess what's going to happen to him. So that last quote, again, according to Hillman, Hillman's house burned, burned to the ground on what this writer who described what happened to Hillman's house described as it was a hot, witchy day in the 60s, quote unquote. And Hillman himself, this guy on the screen himself, Bird's founding member, says, quote, Crosby was at my house an hour before the blaze. I can't connect it yet. Where the Satan factor came into play with David. But I'm working on it. Close quote. Cold. Cold and spooky. Big sister Elaine C is in the place to be. And now. I promised y'all a marathon. But we don't want to. We don't want to keep going on and on. If you're, if you're willing to go another chapter, want to do another chapter? Where the Satan factor came into play with David? A hot witchy day? A hot witchy day, that tells me that the writer was probably privy to the fact that it was some craft behind the burning down of Chris Hillman's house that's what that part tells me the fact that Chris Hillman himself said Crosby would yeah yeah Crosby was over here earlier now I can't quite connect it I can't put my finger on it but uh, in some kind of way that Satan factor fits in and Crosby having been here so Chris was suspicious to say the least. So now, mm -hmm. Mary Gus says so graciously, please do another chapter. Now, if a person asks me something like that, if you ask me that way, it's just about equivalent to Jessica saying, weed. So I'm going to weed. But first, let's pay some bills. I've got to pay the water bill. And so, perhaps I can regale you with a enchanting tune. Brought to you in part by Ridgemont Music and in part by the Unplugum Channel. This is called What Would I Do? Featuring that gentleman of gentlemen's Unplugum himself. And right after this, we will continue. Chapter 13, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. By David McGowan. Rest in peace, Brother David. All praise is due to the living and true. We need forgiving if we're living and not living for you.
Christian witness with relentless sentences like a javelin traveling They've distances. They've babbling, babbling senselessness, but I haven't been Rappers listening. are glistening like the infants just lathered in vassal. Just a shining, cause you let Lucifer slither and paddle. We gon' get it on, cause we don't get along, so we battle. Had you in saber strike distances. Since it's intense, then the intent is dismantling. Wrestling, devil challenging, business, our father's handling, father Jacob, Isaac, and Alfred. Which is disrespected, not gon' slide off like lanolin. We disconnecting your channel and halogen. Jesus the Christ is the only light with all blessing, no sorrow, no stress in the morrow. He'll make it a leader, no more stress in the borrow. Not top contender, he's the champ. Invite him in your heart. He'll put that spark on your lamp and enlighten any dark spaces and paths that you embark on. Places, foundations, and bases. New endeavors that you start on. Start on. Start on. Show you what to set your heart on. Part on me, I get excited. My wit, the most high lit of my ship, he's pilot. So I'm defending his name like an Israelite with the mic. The king is the Christ with no shame. And they lied to you about the J, cause Jesus is his name. Gang recognized gang. And oh yes, so fresh and burnt bronze flesh, he show came. With my bones and muscles aching. When I'm on the verge of breaking, with every chance I'm taking. When my soul and heart start aching. Oh, so many bonds need breaking when peace of mind is taken. From the ground I stand on shaking. With the earth foundation quaking with every move I'm making. In your presence I'm shaking. In my suits and boots I'm quaking. My formation will be making. Without the Lord, I couldn't catch up, cut the mustard or the relish. Went from helpless to selfless, from jealous to zealous. Anointed and appointed, separated and consecrated. Glad I made it, got so faded. In my youth, I oscillated and postulated. The attention bill got so great, it would've got cut off and God not paid it. I circumcised my heart, hard and waited. With a clean one, you placed it and traded it. The unclean with a right spirit and gave it. A test that turned to a testament of John might hear who made it. Well, surrender, let him break on you. And he'll take you, and we make you bind up and cast away the fake you. And then he'll take you, and we make you bind up and cast away the fake you. 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 And we're back. And we're going to get right into chapter 13, David McGowan's superior work, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, chapter 13, eight miles high and falling fast. We're going to be talking more about the birds. So there's going to be some Rick, J there's going to be some Rick James in here. Quite possibly. So let's get into it. The minor birds. Okay, right. Look at the minor birds and then the birds, but 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 Rick James was affiliated with um this Laurel Canyon crew as well so I believe he's going to be showing up as well but let's see so here we go this is lead singer of the birds not the minor birds but the birds B-Y-R-D-S Chris Hillman and that's the group the birds okay quote I'd have to say that personally speaking, Crosby was for, let's run it back, run it back, run it back, quote, I'd have to say that personally speaking, 
Crosby was worse for the good feelings of the local rock and roll scene than Manson was. Close quote. And that very bold statement was made by Terry Terry Melcher. One of the most influential people lurking about the periphery of the Laurel Canyon scene was the Bird's first producer, Terry Melcher. It's fairly well known that Melcher was the son of virginal actress Doris Day, who was just 16 when impregnated and 17 when Terry was born. Not as virginal as she was prom promoted to be. Melcher's father was trombonist Al Jordan, who reportedly beat Doris Day, and likely Terry as well. Jordan wasn't around for long, though. His death, when Melcher was just two or three years old, was yet another Hollywood suicide. After an equally short-lived second marriage, Doris Day married her agent and producer, Marty Melcher, who was universally regarded as one of the biggest a-holes in Hollywood. <clears throat> and that's not an easy title to attain given the fierce competition. Like Jordan, Melcher was well known for being a tyrannically violent and abusive man. He also reportedly embezzled some $20 million from his wife slash client. On the bright side, though, he did adopt and help raise Terry, who took his name. Terry Melcher, perhaps more so than anyone else, had deep ties to virtually all aspects of the Canyon scene, including the Laurel Canyon musicians, the Manson family, the group of young Hollywood actors generally referred to as the Young Turks, and the Vito Palikas dance troupe. Let's take a look at Terry Melcher, their manager, the Bird's manager, right quick. And reconnection is successful, and here is Terry Melcher. With that 60s era stash. Men don't stash like this anymore. All right, Terry Melcher, all right. Record producer, all right. Let's see. Okay. As it turns out, Melcher first met Vito Palikas when Terry was still in high school in the late 1950s. As Melcher explained and later recalled, Vito was an art instructor. Quote, Vito was an art instructor. When I was in high school, we'd go to his art studio because he had naked models. A half decade or so later, Melcher and Polikas would, each in his own way, become key players in launching not just the career of the Birds, but the entire Laurel Canyon music scene, as well as the accompanying youth countercultural counter counter movement. <clears throat> and while still in high school, Melcher befriended Bruce Johnston, the adopted son of a top executive with the Rexall drugstore chain. While growing up on the not-so-mean streets of Beverly Hills and Bel Air, the two recorded together as singing duo Bruce and Terry. I saw that down here. Oh, what an album cover. You just want to run out and grab that. I bet it's some dope break beats on there. Probably some good drums. <coughs> Uh, Johnson, Johnston also played in the high school band with Phil Spector. Y'all have seen Phil Spector before, right? He looked like a Phil Spector. Especially in his older years, which is what I'm familiar with. I saw him when he was on trial. I didn't know him when I was a child. Phil Spector. Oh, it was a movie about him, too. We can just pull him up. Okay, this is him when he was when he was a young gun, a young hot shot. There's Phil. But this is the way I remember seeing him on TV when he was on trial. Look at this fro. <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? Man? Oh 
Oh Lord have mercy. Just let us have some things. Uh <clears throat> let's move on. All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Please excuse me. Johnston also played in the high school band with Phil Spector, who it will be recalled shared with Melcher and various others in this story the distinction of having lost a parent to an alleged act of suicide. I'm not going to be able to stop joking if this is on the screen, so let's go back to Terry Melcher. As has been pointed out already, it was Spectre's crack team of studio musicians dubbed The Wrecking Crew who provided the instrumental tracks for countless albums by Laurel Canyon bands before Dr. Dre joined the group. Bruce Johnston, meanwhile, went on to become a Beach Boy, replacing Wrecking Crew member Glenn Campbell, who had briefly replaced... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sister Mary. <clears throat> Let's go back. Bruce Johnston, meanwhile, went on to become a Beach Boy, replacing Wrecking Crew member Glenn Campbell, who had briefly replaced Brian Wilson after Brian abruptly decided that he no longer wanted to perform live. Brian's brother Dennis forged a close bond with Terry Melcher as well as with Greg Jacobson, a, a would-be actor and talent scout <clears throat> who was married to famed comedian Lou Costello's daughter. Lou Costello of Abbott and Costello fame. The trio of, of, the trio of Wilson, Melcher, and Jacobson who dubbed themselves this is a this is kind of a sus name. <laughs> the trio of Wilson, Melcher, and Jacobson. <laughs> oh dog. It's not even that late yet. Wilson, Melcher, Jacobson. You got to see it because you, you're going to think I'm kidding. Somebody already knows. <laughs> the Golden Penetrators. The trio of Wilson... Melcher and Jacobson, who dubbed themselves the Golden Penetrators. With Wilson referring to himself rather subtly as the Wood. <laughs> Help me, Lord. Infamously forged a close bond with the musician prophet slash penetrator by the name of Charles Manson. In 1966, Melcher, along with Mark Lindsay and the band Paul Revere and the Raiders, leased and moved into the soon-to-be infamous home at 10050 CeeLo Drive in Benedict Canyon. This guy is more connected than T.K. Kirkland. and Forrest Gump put together okay um, Lindsay would later have the dubious distinction of also living for a time in that other infamous Canyon death house on Wonderland Avenue Lindsay was also a regular visitor to the log cabin the White House where Frank Zappa lived the two were soon joined by Melcher's girlfriend, actress Candace Bergen, Murphy Brown herself. That was that was Belcher's girlfriend. She liked the stash. She said, It gives you distinction. And there's Doris Day in Melcher. <coughs> okay. Murphy Brown. Melcher and Bergen remained in the home until early 1969, frequently entertaining high-profile guests from both the music and film industries. During the summer of 1968, when Charlie Manson and numerous members of his entourage, including Charles Tex Watson and Dean Morehouse, they were shacking up with Melcher's sidekick Dennis Wilson, 
Watson and Morehouse. Hold on. Okay, it's kind of a run-on sentence. <clears throat> Pardon me. During the summer of 1968, when Charlie Manson and numerous members of his entourage, including Charles Tex Watson and Dean Morehouse, were shacking up with Melcher's sidekick Dennis Wilson, Watson and Morehouse were known to regularly visit the Melcher Berger, uh, the Melcher Candace Bergen home on CeeLo Drive. So they was already coming to this house. Charlie Manson is known to have visited the Melcher home on several occasions as well and to have occasionally borrowed Melcher's Jaguar. Just after Melcher and Candace Bergen vacated the home, Jacobson reportedly arranged for Morehouse to live there briefly before Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski took possession in February of 1969 during Morehouse's stay. So see, what is being intimated here it's what Dave is subtly I think building a case for saying is that these folks were all involved like it's no coincidence it's not that the house is haunted but these people all have these relationships and so it's likely that they were all involved in some way in one or both the murders. During Morehouse's, um, uh, right, before Tate and Polanski took possession in February of 1969. So during Morehouse's stay, Tex, who would later be portrayed as the leader of the Tate and, Le and LaBianca hit squads, <clears throat> came calling regularly. So he came over there regularly too, Charles Tex Watson. His address book would later be found to contain a phone number for a former Polanski resident. So Polanski was already in with these folks. Watson had moved out from L.A. to Texas. Pardon me. Watson had moved out to L.A. from Texas. That's why they called him Tex. In 1966, after opting to drop out of college with those who knew him, which those who knew him viewed as being wildly out of character for him to want to drop out of college. By the spring of 1968, when Charles Watson met Charles Manson at Dennis Wilson's home, Beach Boy Dennis Wilson's home, Tex was the modish co-owner of Crown Wig Creations on the corner of Santa Monica Boulevard and Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Through that business enterprise, he had developed extensive Hollywood contacts, contacts that came in handy when he began handling large drug transactions and large piles of cash for Charlie Manson. Tex Watson soon grew so close to Manson that, according to Ed Sanders, he was known to complain at times, quote, that he actually thought he was Charlie. Close quote. According to Vanity Fair, Tex, Tex Watson was also a regular patron of the whiskey, the Whiskey A Go Go, which isn't too surprising given that Elmer Valentine's Club was well known to be a major drug trafficking site during the late 1960s. Watson's frequent sidekick, Dean Morehouse, by the way, hailed from Mino, North Dakota, identified by Maury Terry as the longtime home of a process faction, the process group, with deep ties to Offutt Air Force Base. Though it is purely speculation, it seems entirely possible that Morehouse served as a handler for both Charlies, Manson, and Watson. <clears throat> Perhaps tellingly, Vincent Bugliosi mentioned Morehouse only once in his nearly 700 page treatment of the Manson case, in much the same way that David Crosby ignored Vito Polikas in his wordy autobiography. In the spring of 1969, the trio of Wilson, Melcher, and Jacobson got close to Bobby Boussole as well. 
Jacobson made at least two trips to the Gerard Theatrical Agency to hear dem demo tapes that Bobby had recorded. The agency, headed by Jack Gerard, specialized in supplying topless dancers to CD clubs and in supplying actors and actresses for porno film shoots. Bet you didn't know, bet you didn't know that those agencies that represent actors also rep represent porn stars. Two. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's move on. B back in the day, they used to say a lot of different actors actually got their start in the porn world. And what would happen is <coughs> that once they made the transition into quote unquote regular Hollywood would but once they make that crossover from the world of porn into the world of quote unquote legitimate film let's call it that whatever <coughs> they buy up their their company or their agency will purchase all of the available copies that this person is involved in and that's how they would remove that history from that individual if you remember some years back and it came out in the news it was all on the breakfast club and everywhere that um, Lawrence Fishburne was attempting to do the same for one of his daughters who had gotten caught, in, caught up in that industry some kind of way <coughs> and um also, Clint Eastwood, many years ago. Now, I remember Big Ted telling me this, so I don't know this other than I've heard it since then. But I think I'm saying Clint, Clint Eastwood had a wife or, or love interest or girlfriend or something who also had started off in the um, Blue movies. And he did the same thing. You know, he went and bought up all of the copies. But... Let's move on. So, it's just interesting because this looks like that type of seedy character. Like, you know, he could have been in a Boogie Nights movie. One of the executives in Boogie Nights. Okay, let's move on. Um, which was a movie about that industry that starred Mark, Mark Wahlberg some years ago. But anyway, <clears throat> okay. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, the agency headed by Jack Gerard specialized in supplying topless dancers to seedy clubs and actors and actresses for porno film shoots. Beausoleil's primary job with the agency was to deliver carloads of girls to the clubs. More than a few of those girls were members of Charlie's family, the Manson family. In March of 1969, just months before he was arrested for the torture, murder of Gary Hinman, Bobby signed a songwriting contract with the agency and began recording demos. Bobby Boussole also accompanied Melcher and Jacobson on at least two trips out to the Spawn Movie Ranch, once in May of 69 and then again in the next month. Jacobson was a frequent visitor to Spahn and was known to boast of having held over 100 hours of conversations with the all-knowing prophet known as Charles Manson. Greg also lobbied NBC to shoot a documentary film about the Manson family's hippie commune. And the network was for a time interested in the project. <coughs> Along with Dennis Wilson, Jacobson also arranged for Charlie to record at an unnamed studio in Santa Monica. That session was also attended by Terry Melcher, who's on the screen, Bobby Beausoleil, and several of the Manson girls. Let's, let's look at Bobby Beausoleil. And why do I picture um, Adam Sandler every time I say that?
because I'm silly. Lucifer Rising album by Bobby Beausoleil. Oh, I bet that's jamming. Lots of good samples on there. Part one, part two. Lucifer Rising album by Bobby Beausoleil. Hey. Jamming. Oh, he looked like a Bobby Beausoleil. <clears throat> oh my goodness oh yes look at the power the power of Lucifer look at the power powerful man of Lucy oh yeah rock on anyway All right. It means good sun. It would have to mean good sun. Soleil means means the sun. Bo or boy sun, right? Bo is boy. Right? Bon is good in French. <coughs> bon. So it's boy sun or boy sun. Bo, right? They look like they have no power. Like you punch a hole straight through his chest. Uh, anyway, violence is not the answer. Besides, now he's an older gentleman. Well, he was. Right, ripped, right? He's going to be ripped when he get down there. Yeah, he's still alive. He's still alive. Criminal penalty, death, commuted to light, life. Okay. American murderer who was sentenced to death for killing his friend Gary Hinman, a fellow associate of Charles Manson and members of his communal Manson family. So he was a he was a member of the family and likely under MK Ultra too. Okay. Okay. Along with Dennis Wilson, Jacobson also arranged for Charlie to record at an unnamed studio in Santa Monica. That session was also attended by Terry Melcher, Bobby Beausoleil, and several of the Manson girls. Lest anyone think otherwise, by the way, the Manson family certainly had no shortage of talented musicians. Convicted murderer Charles Manson, of course, was widely viewed by his contemporaries in the canyon as a talented singer songwriter guitarist so too was Bobby Beausoleil who had jammed with Dennis Wilson played rhythm guitar for the pre-love lineup known as the Grassroots knew Frank Zappa and <coughs> pardon me and had visited the log cabin and later composed and recorded the film score for Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising. Convicted murderer Patricia Krenwinkel was an accomplished guitarist and songwriter. Convicted murderer Steve Clem Grogan was a talented musician as well. He later played in the prison band assembled, assembled by Boussole to record the Lucifer Rising soundtrack. In addition, Family members Brooks Poston and Paul Watkins were accomplished musicians, and Catherine Gypsy Cher was a virtuoso violin player as well as being a singer and occasional actress. See, for example, Ram Rodder, co starring Bobby Beausoleil and filmed partially at Where Else? Spawn Movie Ranch. Now, Catherine Cher, and I'm sure that's not her real last name. It's H S H A R E. <clears throat> Probably a play on something. Okay, they were into the uh, um, how did Grady say it? They was into orgies. So Cher would be it. Anyway, Catherine Cher is notable in other ways as well, including her unparalleled feat of raising the bar so high on parental suicides that no one else, even in Laurel Canyon, is likely to be able to clear it. 
orphaned as a child. Now let's let's pull her up if we can. Catherine Share. Because this is going to be a trip. <laughs> booty booty. When cultural appropriation goes wrong. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, what's her name? Share. Catherine Share. Strangers in the night Exchanging glances There she is Strangers in the night Here's Catherine Cher And here she is during the Manson days With the X on her head So this is the Catherine Cher that we're speaking of Today she may have totally reformed and given her life to the Lord and everything now so let's keep that in mind too about folks that we're talking about okay <clears throat> all right so it says Catherine Shear was orphaned as a child when both biological parents purportedly committed suicide Gypsy was adopted by a psychologist and his wife. Her adopted mother then allegedly committed suicide as well, leaving her to be raised by her adoptive father. Cher is also notable, Catherine Cher is also notable for being the oldest of Charlie's girls, nearly 27 at the time of the murders. Most of the other girls were under 21, and many, including Dean Morehouse's daughter, Ruth Ann Morehouse were minors. Gypsy lived with Bobby Boussoleil before meeting and living with Manson. And she seemed to serve as a recruiter for both of them. According to Ed Sanders, Gypsy Cher, Gypsy Catherine Cher, also arranged for Paul Rothschild, the producer of The Doors, to hear the Manson family music. It seems as though just about everyone had an opportunity to hear the family's music. Some of it was recorded in Beach Boy Brian Wilson's state-of-the-art home recording studio. <clears throat> some was recorded by Terry Melcher at Greg. Uh, pardon me. Some was recorded by Terry Melcher and Greg Jacobson at Spawn Ranch, using a mobile recording studio. Some was recorded in Santa Monica. By some reports. Some was recorded by a major Hollywood studio. Other recordings were likely made as well, though nobody really likes to talk about such things. Greg Jacobson recorded many of his marathon conversations with Charlie, but as with the demo recordings made by Dennis Wilson, everyone likes to pretend that such recordings were lost or destroyed or never existed. The Manson family was filmed at Spawn Ranch by Melcher as well. Family members also shot an extensive amount of film making home movies, which some witnesses have claimed included family orgies and ritualized snuff films. A vast amount of NBC camera equipment and film was found to be in the possession of Charlie's motley crew all of which was claimed to be stolen. It seems likely, however, given the network's known involvement with the family, that the equipment was provided to them so that they could film their exploits. When not hanging out with Charlie and Tex and Bobby, Terry Melcher, going back to the producer guy, the stash, Terry Melcher also found time to produce the records that first catapulted the birds to fame, Mr. Tambourine Man, or oh, really, and to everything turn, 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 there is a season turn, turn, turn. I only know that piece because I saw it on a commercial advertising old hippie records. 
The first recorded in January 1965 and released a few months later was the record that announced to the world the arrival of a new breed of music. I'm just 49. Those early hits were created simply enough by borrowing from the songbooks of folk legends Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger and then playing those songs on amplified equipment. <coughs> Dylan himself followed suit not long after at the Newport Folk Festival in July 1965, much to the consternation of the gathered crowd of folkies who wanted to hear some folk music. In Hotel California, the book, Barney Huskins, this is Hoskins, Barney Hoskins writes that the birds were, from the very outset, conceived as an electric rock and roll group. What Hoskins doesn't really clarify, though, is who exactly it was that initially conceived of this hugely influential band in those terms. Surely it wasn't the band members themselves who decided that they were going to pioneer a new musical genre, <clears throat> since they probably had their hands full with just learning to play their instruments. It would probably be slightly more accurate to say that the birds appear to have been initially conceived as an electric folk rock group. By July of 1966, however, when the band released its third album, featuring the Gene Clark penned Eight Miles High, it had morphed into something different, and by doing so, helped pioneer another genre of music, psychedelic rock. With the later addition of Graham Parsons and the growing influence of Chris Hillman, the birds would next morph into a country rock band, thus helping to spawn that genre of music as well. According to rock and roll legend, the first two birds to get together were James Joseph McGuinn III and Harold Eugene Clark. McGuinn hailed from Chicago, the son of best-selling authors James and Dorothy McGuinn. Considered a very talented guitarist, Jim had played with Bobby Darin, the Limelighters, and the Chad Mitchell Trio. In 1962, he left the Chad Mitchell Trio and worked for a time in New York City as a studio musician before hearing the call that so many others seemed to hear and making his way to Los Angeles. Once there, he wasted no time hooking up with Gene Clark. Clark had been born in Tipton, Mississippi. Clark had been born in Tipton, Missouri the second oldest in a family of 13 siblings. They're into that too. There's something about that that they're into. Um, a family with 13 children. Of course, they, they want to try to opt everything <clears throat> and take it, for them, take it for themselves. Luciferian appropriation. It's 12 disciples plus one Jesus, 13. So it was ours first. Anyway. And under lie, pardon me, Clark. Okay, let's look at Gene Clark right quick. Because I have no visual reference for Gene Clark at all. American singer, songwriter. There he is, an American singer-songwriter and founding member of the folk rock band The Birds. So Gene Clark is a founding member and Chris Hillman. Okay, so let's put them two together. Slide you on down here where you belong. Love lift us up where we belong. Okay, anyway, here we go. Okay. Okay, Clark had been born in Tipton, Missouri, <clears throat> the second oldest in a family of 13 siblings, an undeniably talented songwriter and vocalist. Clark cut his first record 
with a local rock and roll combo when he was just 13 years old. He later joined the New Christie Minstrels, a vocal ensemble known during his tenure primarily for the hit song Green Green. Like so many others, however, Gene soon found himself packing his bags for, where else, Los Angeles, where he met up with the recently arrived Jim McGuinn. The newly formed folk duo soon added a third voice to the mix, our old friend David Crosby, who had formerly been a vocalist with Les Baxter's Balladeers. Jim McGuinn, David Crosby. Jim Roger McGuinn and David Crosby in case you've never seen him before brace yourselves he really looks the part Look like Captain Kangaroo's first cousin or something. You would never expect this. This is the witch and the warlock. Behind a lot of stuff going on up there at, at the canyon. There he is when he was younger. David Crosby. <clears throat> okay. Crosby brought in manager Jim Dixon with whom he had done some solo sessions in 1963. The year before that, Dixon had produced a self-titled album for a band known as The Hillmen, featuring a young mandolin player out of San Diego named Chris Hillman. That's Chris. Okay. Hillman had cut his first album with a band known as the Scottsville Squirrel Bakers. Known as the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers. <laughs> I don't know what's crazier, a barking squirrel or trying to bake one. I bet you go out into the Ozarks, you might get you some, you might get you some baked squirrel. Anyway, with a band known as the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers while still in high school. He was a highly regarded young bluegrass musician and was generally considered to be a virtuoso mandolin player, which I guess is why Jim Dixon cast him to play the part of the bass player in the world's first folk rock band. And as we already know, Hillman lucked out in, in securing luxurious living accommodations, right? It, right? it just fell in his lap, right? The dentist just rolled up to him and said, hey, you looking for a place to stay? And as we already know, Hillman lucked out in securing luxurious living accommodations right in the heart of what was to become the music community's epicenter. So he was all set to become a rock star. Raised on a ranch in San Diego, Hillman had traveled alone to Berkeley when he was just 15, ostensibly to take private mandolin lessons. At about that same time, his father had, wait for it, reportedly committed suicide. Those two closely aligned events would, I guess, have had a profound impact on the young musician. For those who are wondering about a particular question, and we're not talking about this in particular per se, but for those who are wondering about a particular question, A person who is not, remember, a curse causeless shall not come. Say it with me. A curse causeless shall not come. But folks who are not covered, who believe whatever they want to believe, they're free 
or so they think they're free from whatever religious ties or whatnot. Those are some of Lucifer's favorite people to target for sacrifice. Actually, the artist targets a person. I've always heard it said that the artist picks the person. And the coven can make it appear to be a suicide. You can be... As soon as you're of the age of accountability, you can make a pact with Satan. So there have been folks who have made those pacts. And offered up their adopted parents as the sacrifice but let's let's finish this chapter chapter 13 <clears throat> is rough okay raised on a ranch in San Diego Hillman had traveled alone to Berkeley when he was just 15 ostensibly to take private mandolin lessons at about that same time his father had wait for it reportedly committed suicide those two closely aligned events would i guess have had a profound impact on the young musician hillman would ultimately become a skilled bass player and a major figure in the laurel canyon spawned country rock movement like many others of that bent Hillman had been a huge fan of Spade Cooley during his formative years, and he later cited Cooley as a major influence in, on his own musical direction. Most readers are probably not familiar with the story of the King of Western Swing, which is kind of a shame because as stories go, it's a pretty good one. So let's digress here briefly and meet the man who was frequently cited as one of the forefathers of country rock and whom Brian Wilson has cited as a major influence as well spade cooley that sounds like a brother but we'll see no it's not okay <clears throat> well then again donald clyde cooley better known as spade cooley Wow. Okay, it was, an, it was an American convicted murderer and former Western swing musician, big band leader, actor, and TV personality. Okay. Let's read about old Cooley. <clears throat> Throat's getting dry. One second. around like a water balloon <clears throat> just don't stick a pin in my belly okay here we go during the 1940s and 1950s Donnell Clyde Spade Cooley yeah he's a light-skinned dude was oh wait he's trying to pass was a popular local musician and band leader his weekly shows at the Redondo Beach Pier could draw as many as 10,000 appreciative fans, few of whom knew of his alcohol, alcohol <coughs> pardon me, few of whom knew of his alcoholism, violent temper, or prior arrest for attempted rape. His popularity ultimately landed him his own television show, The Spade Cooley Hour. His career, however, came to an abrupt end on April 3rd, 1961, when he tortured and murdered his young wife, Ella Mae Cooley, while forcing his 14-year-old daughter to watch in horror. My gosh. According to court transcripts, Ella Mae had been spending a considerable amount of time in the company of two men identified as Luther Jackson and Bud Davenport both of whom worked in the sprawling CIA-infested medical research facility at UCLA. 
See, I initially uh, said it when I saw the name Spade because Spade is an old colloquialism and um, racial slur for for black folks. They call you a Spade. That's old 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 time stuff. But this is old time stuff, so that's why I said that. Anyway, <clears throat> on the day of her death, Ella May had made the rather bold decision. Oh man, she made a big mistake. Lord have mercy. Should never have cost her her life. <sighs> On the day of her death, Ella May had made the rather bold decision to tell this fool that she was about to join into a sex cult. Ella May had made the rather bold decision to inform Spade that the two men had initiated her into a free love cult and that she had decided to give up her family and all her possessions to join the group, which was in the process of buying land near the ocean to build and operate a private compound. I think he's passing. It was a lot of that. Just, just as a side note, y'all, y'all know they say, um, "Hello, Dolly." Hello, Dolly. Was it Carol Channing? Carol Channing. I didn't know, but I heard that she was passing. She, she was passing. But like. It, but I think I think what she ended up saying was that she was biracial. But anyway, a lot of biracial or very light skinned people just identified with white. It was it was called passing is what they called it. If black folk found out that you was doing it on the sly, they'll talk junk about you. But every black family wanted somebody in their family to be able to slip through them cracks. And quite often that would be the case. This person that passed, and again, I'm just, I don't know this to be true, but I'm just, I'm going off a of spade. I'm going off of his look, you know, but, so again, I don't know this to be true for this man, Spade Cooley. I don't know that, but I know I have always heard that about Carol Channing and a lot of different, act, um, a lot of different actresses and actors have attempted to pass. And not just actors and actresses, people in politics, um, folks um, in every walk of life. It was just something that people did. There's, There's been entire Oprah episodes on people that passed before. So if that's new to y'all, expand your horizons. But let's move on. <clears throat> let's, move, let's move past that. Like I said, I'm just, I'm making that assumption here based on these names and things I'm seeing um, so he so she tells him that she's going to leave her give up her family and all her possessions to join the group Spade Cooley's response to his wife's declaration was to brutally beat stomp and strangle her to death but only after repeatedly burning her with a lit cigarette all of this was witnessed by daughter Melody. I'm telling you, he's black. I'm telling you, who had been told by her father that now you're going to watch me kill this whore. Lord have mercy. After doing just that, Spade then asked his daughter if she thought that Ella May was really dead, adding, Well, let's see if she is. He then proceeded to burn her lifeless body repeatedly with another lit cigarette until he apparently was satisfied that she was indeed dead. Unlike so many other celebrity homicide suspects, Cooley was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to serve a life sentence. He was sent to the rather notorious Vacaville facility where he served eight years before being offered early parole. Just before his scheduled release, he arranged the November 23, 1969 comeback concert in Oakland for which his captors had agreed to release him on a three-day pass. 
The concert was reportedly a huge success, and it looked as though Cooley's star was about to shine once again upon his pending re release from prison. But that's not quite how this story ends. Instead, Cooley walked back to his dressing room right after the show and promptly dropped dead thus ending the saga of Spade Cooley and allowing us to return to where we left off after that is taking one more quick detour here to note that not long after Spade Cooley was scheduled for release another peripheral character in this story decided that it might be a good idea to kill his wife as well Humble Harv Miller Humble, he wasn't so humble, he killed his wife, Humble Harv Miller DJ um, Humble Harvey Miller, or Humble Harv Miller was a popular DJ on LA's number one pop music station during that era. Uh, was a number one DJ. Was a popular DJ on LA's number one pop music station during that era, KHJ, on the AM dial. During the latter half of the 1960s, Miller was yet another of the players who helped launch the careers of the Laurel Canyon bands by being the first to get their new singles on the radio. But then he like Cooley, killed his wife and was sent to prison. Also like Cooley, he was granted early release, but unlike Spade Cooley, Miller successfully resumed his career. And now, at long last, we can return to the birds. The bird, bird, bird. Okay, by, by mid-1964, the nucleus of what would become the band had formed with the bonding of McGuinn and Clark. Can we look at Clark? Okay, we got all these characters up here. We don't have Clark up here. Nope. Okay, that's Roger McGuinn and Clark. Well, we don't need that. We don't need that. Okay, let's just let's just keep going. That's a side note. Um, okay. <clears throat> Between the two of them, they would they would provide the band with its signature twelve string guitar sound, its two lead vocalists, and in the early years, at least, its best songwriters. Then along came David Crosby who added little more than harmony vocals, at least on the first two albums, but who seems to have largely hijacked the band with the help of manager Jim Dixon, who added fake bass player but real musician Chris Hillman. Crosby then rounded out the band by adding fake drummer Michael Clark. Clark had been born Michael Dick in Spokane, Washington. At 17, Michael Dick ran away from home and hitchhiked to the land of enchantment known as California. Those hot a party. Apparently becoming Michael Clark along the way. Clark. It's a popular name. You have you have a cricketer, an actor, Michael Clark Duncan, and this guy. That's definitely from that era. Okay, that's the birds. Okay, there's Michael Clark. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> wow. The sixties. Okay. The year was 1963. According to rock history as told by David Crosby, Clark and Crosby met in Big Sur, which coincidentally happens to be the location of the notorious 
Esalen Institute, where CSNY would play some years later. A year later, the vagrant teenager with no drumming experience would find himself cast to play the role of the drummer in the band designed to be America's answer to the Beatles. According to Crosby, Michael Clark's first L.A. address was the home of Terry Melcher. Uh Uh-oh. Doesn't look like a good fit for Michael. Michael. Mr. Melcher wants to see you. The band, now complete, first dubbed themselves the Jet Set and then the Beef Eaters. Even even recording a less than memorable single under the latter moniker. Of course, we know they're talking about the Beef Eaters outside of the Queen's Castle. not talking about a food preference you uncultured philistine members of the sovereign's bodyguard of the yeoman god extraordinary popularly known as the beef eaters ceremonial guardians of the tower of london Founded by King Henry the Seventh of England. Their motto is Dieu et Montoin. The yeoman waters of Her Majesty's Royal Palace. You have to sound pompous like that. The pomposity must flow. That's how you get in character. Anyway, all right, let's move on. <clears throat> okay. The band, now complete, first dubbed themselves the Jet Set and then the Beef Eaters, even, even recording a less than memorable single under the latter moniker, before finally settling on the birds. Before the end of 1964, Jim Dixon had signed the band to a deal with Columbia Records. As Barney Hoskins recounts in Waiting for the Sun, the obvious ineptitude of Michael Clark and shakiness of most of the others was still a problem when Jim Dixon got the band signed to Columbia in November. Columbia assigned the new band to staff producer Terry Melcher. That assignment, it would seem, was a rather fortuitous one given that the fledgling band's rehearsal space just happened to be in the very same basement studio that Melcher snuck off to while in high school. Just two months after signing with Columbia, the band, or rather its surrogates, were already in the studio recording (coughs) Mr. Tambourine Man at the... (coughs) Pardon me. At the insistence... Of Jim Dixon. Need some water. Mr. Tambourine Man. How does that go? I know it sounds very gentle. I think I hear it now in my head. Mr. Tambourine Man. It's like super gentle. Gluten free. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> okay. 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 Uh, okay, just two months after signing with Columbia, the band, or rather its surrogates, were already in the studio recording Mr. Tambourine Man at the insistence of Jim Dixon. Despite the objections of various band members claimed that the song was far too soft. Dixon reportedly pushed hard for the song to be the band's first single. I'm just kidding. I added that. Getting playful. This will have to be the last chapter. 
on March 26, 1965. It's Dwight's birthday. Just two months after pretending to lay down the instrumental tracks for Mr. Tambourine Man, the Birds played their first real live show as the first act at the refurbished and reopened Ciro's nightclub. I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure, but I'm going to go out on the limb here and guess that a band whose entire rhythm section was just learning to play their instruments probably did not put on a very compelling performance. The Birds apparently played one other live show before the Ciro's opening, though the nature of that show appears to be in dispute or perhaps there were two previous shows. According to Jim Dixon, the Bird's first public gig was booked by Lenny Bruce's mother, Sally Mark. She got them a job at Los Angeles City College, noon assembly for a half hour. According to Carl Franzoni and various others, however, it was Vito Palikas who booked the Bird's first live show at a rented hall on Milrose Avenue just a day or two before the show at Ciro's. In any event, Mr. Tambourine Man was released about a month after the band had its big public debut at Ciro's and the LA music scene would never be the same again. Before long, clubs big and small were popping up all along the fabled Sunset Strip and bands were spilling out of Laurel Canyon to play them. As Terry Melcher recalled, quote, kids came from everywhere. It just happened. One day you couldn't drive anymore. It was like overnight. You couldn't drive on the strip. Close quote. That soon would change. By the summer of 1967, the mythical summer of love, the club scene <clears throat> and we're back. Pardon me. By the summer of 1967, the mythical summer of love, the club scene on the strip was quickly dying. It had become killed, deliberately or not, by some of the key players who had created it. Terry Melcher, producer of the scene's first band. Lou Adler, business partner of club owner Elmer Valentine. And John Phillips, leader of the Mamas and the Papas. It was the show they produced, you see, the fabled Monterey Pop Festival held on June 16th through the 18th, 1967, that killed the Sunset Strip scene. The bands that had filled the clubs became literally overnight too big to play such intimate venues. Over the course of the next decade, Laurel Canyon bands quickly moved from clubs to concert halls to massive sports arenas. But here we are, I suppose, getting ahead of ourselves. As for the birds, they carried on for a good many years, albeit with numerous personnel changes. First out was the man who many feel was the most talented member of the group, Gene Clark, who dropped out in March of 1966 just one year after the band that had first taken the stage at Ciro's. Now, this is Michael Clark. Let's look at Gene Clark. We didn't see him. We should take a look at the one guy who could play. Oh, did we look at him? So I've seen this picture before. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. We didn't look at Gene Clark. Okay. All right. Clark was also the first original bird to pass away on May 24th, 1991 at just 46 years of age reportedly due to a bleeding ulcer two and a half years later on December 19th, 1993 Michael Clark died as well when his liver failed Both deaths were attributed to chronic alcoholism. Jim McGuinn, who remained, oh, that's Jim Morrison. Jim McGuinn, Jim Roger McGuinn, who remained a bird through numerous band lineups, 
joined the Subud religious sect in 1965. Two years later, upon the advice of the cult's founder, he changed his name to Roger. Oh, you see, Jim, Jim does not have the proper vibration for what I see coming through your chakras. Once your third eye is open, you will see that within you lives another, another man, a presence. You see, I can tell right now the great Shiva is, 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 is imparting unto me these, these truths, these truths that within you there is a Raja waiting to be awakened. And all you have to do is line up your chakras, use a little bit of the Kundalini fire, some of the serpentine fire, and let it, let it coil up at your spine, and then let it release. And when the Kundalini snake dragon reaches up into your mind, you will no longer be Jim, you will only answer to Raja. A decade later, he became a born-again Christian. In a similar vein, Chris Hillman became an, an invent. <laughs> Chris Hillman. Wow. Chris Hillman became an evangelical Christian in the 1980s, but then later switched to the Greek Orthodox faith. You go through that system. You're going to find religion. Or you're going to want to. It changed your whole perspective and point of view. Hillman played in various birds lineups with Graham Parsons, Flying Burrito Brothers, and in David Geffen's failed attempt at creating a second supergroup, one known as Souther, Hillman, and Fury. David Crosby, of course, left the group. the birds and became one third of David Geffen's first supergroup, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. These days he primarily spends his time inseminating lesbians and occasionally reuniting with former bandmates. I didn't write the book, I'm just telling you what it says. Jim Dixon and Terry Melcher continued to work with some of the birds, particularly Graham Parsons and Chris Hillman. Melcher formed a particularly close bond with fellow trust fund kid Parsons, as did Melcher's sometime sidekick John Phillips. Both Melcher and Phillips, of course, had ties to Charles Manson. Melcher raved about him to Ned Doheny, whose former prison buddy, Phil Kaufman, was as already noted Parsons Road Manager. In unrelated news, Bill Seitens, the Doors Road Manager, was once a paramour of Mansonite Lynette Squeaky From. The family's fingerprints the family's fingerprints it appears can be found in nearly every nook and cranny of the Laurel Canyon scene. And the next chapter will be chapter 14. We've still got 320 people listening in. No, no, no. I wouldn't troll it. That's what it said. <laughs> I'll tell you guys if I'm joking around. We don't want to mess up this great work. To having fun. Mm -hmm. why, are you, why are you answering questions that nobody asked you? Oh, okay. Who is this with a fancy, fancy name <laughs> in here? We don't, we don't want, we don't want your teachings. We don't want your teachings. If I want your teachings, I'll come to your channel. But you're welcome here. Hi, how you doing? You in my house? I, I was always taught to speak when you come to somebody's house. 
But then I'm from Detroit. I don't know who raised you. All right, y'all. So what are you going to do now? Another one? Weed again? Thank you. Weed again? That's got to be enough. That's got to be enough. What is this? Oh, yeah. Two hours and 50. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 2.50. We're going to stop right here. We're going to stop right here. But 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 what I, what I will do for those of you who just like the fellowship, uh, because I'll be on tomorrow night with Days of Noah. And then following that, we'll do prayer requests. Unless we do them. Yeah, yeah, I need to get some rest. But maybe we'll play a little praise and worship set, talk a little bit on another stream. But we need to let this one go because we just did eight hours and then six hours. And I, I, I've been trying to trim this down. So, yes, because people don't watch those. So it's just it's just too much. Not nowadays there's a generation that if they're hungry and you give them a steak they'll tell you it's too big can you cut it up in little pieces for them and I've tried to fight with them as long as I could but I told days ago I said you know we're like a pizza place some of the people come here because they like to sit down, order a whole pizza, and enjoy pizza with family and friends. That's why some people come in. I said, but then other people just want slices. I said, Days, we got to have some slices. We got to have some slices, so I'm going to have some slices. One more chapter, Fanuvi says. Black Rose says one more chapter. Well, if that's the case, um, I'm saying, no, well, well, some people were part of the greatest generation the ones that fought in the world wars <clears throat> and they didn't fight no wars so so when we talk about the greatest generation we're not including them <laughs> so when I'm talking about the downsides of, of, of the present day generation that is, that's heavily entitled of course I'm not talking about those of you who don't have that characteristic I'm talking about those who do Yeah, shorter chunks are more shareable. That's true. But some people does indeed. Some people like to eat a whole pizza. And 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 um, you're a control freak, and I don't want you in here. So you go to your channel and talk to yourself and say what you want to say, and run and run the conversation. And run the conversation, but over here you, you, you're not gonna run nothing but your mouth. So now, I'm gonna read one more chapter. I'll read one more. Okay, okay, this is it. This is it, y'all. It, y'all. This is it. Okay, the great serendipity. Because I did say I was gonna do a marathon. Yeah, some people see a person trying to dominate me becomes an enemy instantly don't try to make me nothing make me listen to you make me change the conversation make me don't make me nothing there's freedom in Christ I have liberty all right let's move forward much much love to you sister Lisa 
And much love to you, Sister Fanuvi. And don't worry about the Fanuvi, they gone. Okay, here we go. Let's let's go to the next one. I just don't like that. Because I, I don't like to do nobody like that. Don't do me like that. If, if, I, if I step into your home, you're having a conversation, either I'm going to shut up and listen or find some sort of way to participate. Okay. All right. Yes, the last chapter, Sister Mary said the last chapter sure was a heavier plate than I expected. Me too. But let's see what's on this one. Because I like to eat. All right, chapter 14, The Great Serendipity, Buffalo Springfield. Let's get our screen ready because I know we're going to have some stuff to pull up. We can get rid of these now, I think. Probably done with Jim Morrison. Now watch, watch we're going to end up needing all of this. I got to leave Phil Spector up there. Just because. Just a bunch of young folks trying to trying to find their way. Some of them anyway. This is why the music business prefers the young. Young, dumb, and full of bubblegum. Okay. <clears throat> All right, the great serendipity. Buffalo Springfield. Which I don't know nothing about. Buffalo Springfield, but I've been Buffalo Wingfield. I'm familiar with that. Okay. Not today. I'm sloshing about. Okay. The Great Serendipity, Buffalo Springfield. This is going to break your heart. Quote. This is going to break your heart. But much of the music you heard in the 60s and early 70s was not recorded by the people you saw in the album covers. <coughs> Excuse me. That's what drinking liquid all day will do for you. And, and I'm opening my mouth and, and drawing in air and sucking up spit. So if I burp, I'm sorry. This is going to break your heart, but much of the music you heard in the 60s and early 70s wasn't recorded by the people you saw on the album covers. It was done by me and the musicians you see on these walls. Many of these kids didn't have the chops and were little more than garage bands. At concerts, people hear with their eyes. Teens cut groups slack in concert, but not when they bought their records. That's true. You just half the fun of the concert is just you happy being there. But that record. And that quote was by Hal Blaine. Drummer. Longtime drummer for the Wrecking Crew. Quoted in the Wall Street Journal on March 23rd, 2011. It was even kind of similar with Motown. Uh, not exactly but like you had the funk brothers who played on a lot of people's music so having a session musician play that's not the sin that's not the you know that's not the problem the problem is again when you know the fans and the teenagers are all being sold that it's this band that, that's making this great music and they're not even making the music they can't sing and in some of the cases as we've read they can't even play the instruments so that was Hal Blaine letting it be known that the wrecking that the wrecking crew were really the ones doing it 
And there he is, showing and proving it as a younger man. And here he is in more recent years, showing and proving it. The most respect for drummers takes a different type of thinking. Okay. So Hal Blaine said that in the Wall Street Journal on March 23rd, 2011. Now, the Birds were the very first rock band. They were the very first folk rock band to take flight out of Laurel Canyon. And they were also the one that achieved the greatest fame, but to many discerning ears, the Sunset Strip's other folk rock powerhouse, Buffalo Springfield, was much more talented. Was the more talented band. In the literature chronicling the 1960s music scene, few stories have been repeated more frequently than the legend surrounding the formation of what would later be regarded as perhaps the first supergroup. All such accounts unquestioningly, unquestioningly retell the story as though it were the gospel truth, seeming oblivious to the improbability of virtually every aspect of the legend. Okay, so we're about to hear a wild legend, which, you know, like, folks, wild legends go along with manufactured artists. All manufactured artists are not devoid of talent. Elvis was not devoid of talent. Lizzo's not devoid of talent. But you understand what's meant by manufactured. So what helps to bolster these artists or what helps to give them some credibility but also some um, some firmness where normally things would be shaky is if you give them a good backstory. Look at Tupac's backstory. Mwah, magnifique. Oh, that's all oh, that's excellent textbook. And then notice also these are the ones certain artists movies are made about. Those are generally people that's been through the machine, baby. And more often than not in this world, if they make a biopic about you, the government wanted people to know about you. If they don't want you if they don't want people to know about you and about your message, they bury you. So they wanted people to know Tupac's message. They wanted people to know Eminem's message. Look at Eminem and his backstory. Oh, what a wild backstory. And if you happen to be from Detroit and you know, you see where the cap is at. You know it's a lot of cap on that story. But see, I didn't live during Elvis' time. But if I lived during Elvis' time, how much cap do you think it is, it is on them stories? So, peep game. So, now we're about to hear about the cap that's on this story. Meaning the extra spin, the exaggeration. Okay. All such accounts unquestionably retell the story as though it were the gospel truth, seemingly oblivious to the improbability of virtually every aspect of the legend. Sound just like Eight Mile. And continuously and curiously, virtually every version of the story contains some form of the word serendipity. Because when you can't explain how some people just... How did he end up at the hip-hop shop on 7 Mile in the first place? You know, if, when you can't explain, then you got to insert the serendipity part. Like, oh, it was just meant to be. Oh, the Island Boys, they just happened to bump into such and such and they signed him. You know, that's, that's the game. I bet you Bruno Mars has a great one. Oh, Janelle Monae's, I'd love to look hers up. I bet you hers is good, too. That's the game. Let's continue. As the story goes, uh, pardon me, and curiously, virtually every version of the story contains some form of the word serendipity, as though everyone has been copying off the same kid's homework. Yeah, that's how CIA backstories generally sound. They're not very creative over there, Langley. 
As the story goes, Stephen Stills and Richard Fure, both formerly of the All Go Go Singers, had recently transplanted themselves to Los Angeles after the breakup of the manufactured folk group. Stills had been the first to relocate in August of 1965. Fure flew out to join him in February 1966 after spending a little time working at defense contractor Pratt and Whitney and the two set their sights on putting together a folk rock band. Meanwhile, up in Toronto, Neil Young and Bruce Palmer were playing in a band known as the Minor Birds, a band fronted by an AWOL Navy man known as Ricky James Matthews, who would later morph into Funkmeister, Torture, or Rapist Rick James, but whose real name was James Ambrose Johnson Jr. The Minor Birds broke up in March of 1965 just after authorities came calling on Matthews and tossed him in the Brooklyn Brig. So they tossed Ulrich James in, in, in jail. You remember we read about that in his autobiography. In certain, because he was AWOL. Remember? And his mama kept you remember he was talking to his mama about it. In search of a new band Neil Young made the curious decision to head out to L.A. for no better reason than that he had what Palmer described as a hunch, a feeling, that Stephen Stills was in L.A. Use the force, Luke. Of course, Young had no clue if Stills was in fact there, nor did he know anyone else in L.A., and you would think that he would have had to realize that even if Stills was there, there was virtually no chance of finding some random person in a city of millions, especially when the person doing the searching had no idea how to get around the city. But no matter, Neil had a calling, so he jumped into an old hearse, of all things, recruited Palmer to ride shotgun, and the two set off on the lengthy trick, trek, trick, huh? to Los Angeles. Neil Young. I do like Neil Young's voice. I like his voice. Don't like his politics or his religion. But I like his voice. I liked his voice. I don't know how it sounds now. It's kind of weird and wimpy voice, but just very memorable and it sounded peaceful everything looked good everything smelled good everything tastes good ain't good cause he gives you that one eye okay They arrived, the legend tells us, on April 1st, 1966. April Fool's Day, appropriately enough, in 1966, the year one to Satanists, and began the search for stills. Several days of searching yielded no results, however, and on the afternoon, on April 6th, the frustrated pair decided to head off to Los to head off to San Francisco in the hopes that maybe they would have better luck finding Stephen there. So I guess they put a flower in their hair and went on off to San Francisco. Perhaps they were going to go on a tour of all the big cities in America in the hopes that somewhere along the way they might find Stephen Steele's. But as fate would have it, just as they were about to head out of the town. Stephen Stills found them. And that's like when people tell me, I was lost until I found the Lord. You was lost, the Lord found you. But as fate would have it, Stills found them. As Barney Hoskins tells the story in Hotel California, the book, early in 
April 1966, Stills and Richard Ferry were stuck in a Sunset Strip traffic jam in Barry Friedman's Bentley. As they sat in the car, Stevens spotted a 1953 Pontiac hearse with Ontario plates on the other side of the street. I'll be damned if that ain't Neil Young, Steele said. What serendipity. Friedman executed an illegal U-turn and pulled up behind the hearse. One of Rock's greatest serendipities, that's exactly what it says right here, y'all. <laughs> One of Rock's greatest serendipities had just occurred. Young, a lanky Canadian, had just driven all the way from Detroit in the company of bassist Bruce Palmer. They'd caught the bug that was drawing hundreds of other pop wannabes to the West. Thank you for correcting this. Brother David says, David McGowan is, is now coming back. The pair had actually driven out from Toronto, not Detroit. And the hearse was a 1959 model by most accounts. And Steels and Fure were in a van rather than a Bentley. But... Such inconsistencies are typical of all Hollywood legends, you see. Let's look at Fury. Richie Fury. I don't even know how to pronounce Richie. Is it actually pronounced Fury? Can't be Fury. Can't be Fury. But it can't be Furry either. Whose last name is Furry? I'm being a bit facetious, y'all, all right? All right. Mm -hmm. In any event, John Einerson, in For What It's Worth, supplies a somewhat longer and more hyperbole-filled version of the legend. What transpired next is no longer considered simply a chance encounter. Transcending mere fact, the events of the next few minutes have taken on mythic proportions to become, in the annals of pop culture, legendary. More than pure luck, coincidence, or serendipity, at that very moment the planets aligned, stars crossed, everyone's karma turned positive, divine intervention interceded the hand of fate revealed itself whatever you describe whatever you subscribe to in order to explain the unexplained or it was a government conspiracy and they were already set up to be together in the first place though each of the five participants in that moment in time tell it slightly differently they weren't properly debriefed. The fact remains that the occupants of the white van thought it was a Bentley. Individually or collectively, depending on who's retelling it, noticed the black hearse with the foreign plate heading the other direction. The plate was on the front. Once the light of recognition came on, the van hastily pulled an illegal and likely difficult in rush hour U-turn and, and a van too maneuvering its way through the line of northbound cars honk honking frantically all the while to pull up behind the hearse sound like a scene in a movie and that's how they reunited oh. one of the passengers leapt up one of the passengers leapt out, ran up, and pounded on the driver's side window of the strange vehicle, yelling to the startled drivers, yelling to the startled travelers inside who had taken no notice of the blaring car horn directly behind them. Hey, Neil, it's me, Steve Stills. Pull over, man. The drivers of the two vehicles managed to find curb space or a vacant store parking lot, again, depending on whose version is being related and the five piled out to embrace and introduce one another. On April 6, 1966, in that late afternoon line of traffic, the course of popular music was altered forever. Anyone who actually lives and drives in L.A. knows that difficult 
is not really the word to describe the feasibility of making an impromptu U-turn in rush hour traffic on the Sunset Strip. The correct word would be impossible. Which is the same word that accurately describes the likelihood of that van maneuvering its way through the line of northbound cars or of it finding curb space on Sunset Boulevard. But let's just play along and assume that Neil Young and Stephen Stills, each of whom for some reason had been dreaming about forming a band with the other. They had a random chance encounter on Sunset Boulevard. In that brief moment in time, a band was formed, or at least four-fifths of a band. Returning to the home of Barry Friedman, who would later legally change his name to Frazier Mohawk, the quartet of musicians quickly decided that their newly formed band would only perform original material, though they didn't yet actually have any original material. They did, though, have three singer songwriter guitarists on board Fure, Young, and Stills, along with a bass player, Bruce Palmer. So, all that they needed was a drummer. Three days later, on April 9th, the sixth on one occasion and the ninth on another, 1966, they acquired one in the form of Dewey Martin, formerly with the Dillards. The Dillards, in another awesome bit of serendipity, had just decided to go back to their acoustic bluegrass roots, so they no longer needed a drummer. They also decided that they had no further need for a whole bunch of new electric instruments and stacks of amplifiers, so Dewey, according to legend, brought all of that with him. The Instaband. Mm. Okay. Okay. Because the Dillards, you know, were just going to throw it all away anyway. So now, with the stars all properly aligned, the band was not only complete, but they each had shiny new electric instruments to play and it all had magically come together in just 72 hours. There was still much work to be done of course. For one thing, they all had to familiarize themselves with those shiny new electric instruments. And they all had to learn to play together as a band. And they had to build up a repertoire of original songs. And they had to rehearse and polish those songs. But not to worry. They had, as we'll see, at least a couple of hours to work on each of those things. Unlike the birds, the members of the Buffalo Springfield were, by all accounts, talented musicians from the outset. Stills and Young were both skilled lead guitarists and songwriters, though Young's vocals were, to be sure, an acquired taste. Fure was an, accom- was an accomplished rhythm guitarist and, s- and songwriter, as well as being the group's best lead vocalist. Bruce Palmer was a respected bass player who, shockingly, actually had experience playing the instrument. And Dewey Martin, several years older than the rest of the crew, had drummed for such legendary artists as the Everly Brothers, Charlie Rich, Roy Orbison, Patsy Cline, and Carl Perkins. None of that, however, explains the absurdly meteoric meteoric rise of Buffalo Springfield. It was it absurdly mete- meteoric. Do you, do you remember? Any of you guys remember? <clears throat> was it was it absurdly meteoric? I have seen this album cover before. I've seen that cover. Like a bunch of fun loving guys. Oh, he's got a kitty. Was that a dog? Oh, that's a dog. Uh, okay. 
anyway I bet you big sister Elaine knows would you would you would you say that it seems like their their rise was meteoric okay let's let's read on April 11th 1966 just five days after the quartet had purportedly first met and just two days after they had added a drummer and acquired instruments the band played its first club date at one of Hollywood's most prestigious venues The Troubadour. Sorry about that. I lost my lost my place. The Troubadour. Four days later, on April 15th, they played the first of six dates around the Southland opening for the Birds, the hottest band on the Strip. That mini tour was followed almost immediately by a six-week stand at the hottest club in town, the Whiskey A Go-Go. That gig wrapped up on June 20th, 1966. A month later, on July 25th, the band landed the opening slot on the most anticipated concert of the year, the Rolling Stones show at the Hollywood Bowl, sponsored by local radio station KHJ. The station, by the way, had just been launched the previous year in May of 1965. Just a few weeks after the birds had taken the world by storm with the release of Mr. Tambourine Man and sparked a folk rock revolution. Just as new clubs magically appeared along the Sunset Strip in anticipation of the about to explode music scene, so too did a radio station magically appear to promote those new clubs and the artists filing them, filling them. Such things tend to happen as we know rather um, serendipitously. Three days after the Stones concert, three days after the Stones concert at the Bowl, Buffalo Springfield released its first single, the Neil Young penned, nowadays Clancy Can't Even Sing, which failed to connect with the record-buying public. Several months later, though, the band would release what was to be its only hit single and what would become the most recognizable protest song of the 1960s. Buffalo Springfield had signed with Atlantic Records, which had been founded in 1947 by Amit Erdogan and dentist investor Herb Abramson. Born in Istanbul, Turkey in 1923, the year the Turk Republic was established, Ahmet was born the son and the grandson of career diplomats and civil serv servants. And if you recall, um, his character was portrayed in Ray, or rather someone portrayed the character of Ahmet in Ray. Here he is. I'm at Ertegon. And there's him and Ray for real in real life. Okay. Okay. Um, Ahmed was born the son and the grandson of career diplomats slash civil servants. His father had been named the first Turkish representative to the League of Nations in 1925 and therefore served as the Turk Republic's ambassador to Switzerland, baby. That's where they hide money. <laughs> Seriously. Ambassador to Switzerland, France, and England. In 1935, he was named the first Turkish ambassador to the United States, and he promptly relocated the family to Washington, D.C. From about the age of 12, Ahmet grew up along D.C.'s Embassy Row, 
attending elite private schools with the sons and daughters of senators, congressmen, and intelligence operatives. In 1947, three years after his father died, Ertegon founded Atlantic Records. At first, the label was home to jazz and R&B artists including Ray Charles, the company's first big star. In the late 1950s, Ertegun took on his first assistant, a guy by the name of Phil the Fro Spectre. Dun, dun, dun. He looked in the mirror and was like, fierce and walked out. Okay. Giving them fierce. Okay, enough. Okay, Atlantic soon shifted focus and rock luminaries like Eric Clapton, Led Zeppelin, and the Rolling Stones would later join the label's stable of talent. Curiously enough, Columbia Records, the corporate entity that signed the birds, was also born in the nation's capital. The name is derived from the District of Columbia, who is a queen mother that who is a queen mother goddess figure that we've talked about many times in our queen mother goddess exposés. And when I say that, I'm talking about the original meaning of Queen Mother Goddess, not the black Twitter meaning, not the meme meaning, not the trending meaning, but what it originated as. It was nothing nice, just like the title queen and the title king and the title lord and so on and so forth and about 80% of the words that we must use in order to convey a rational message. Unless you want to be unintelligible, you will have to use lots of cursed words. You might as well, might as well write it all in cursive. Anyway. Curiously enough, okay, all right, mm -hmm. okay, the name is derived from the District of Columbia, an entity, a spirit, where the label was founded and first headquartered some 125 years ago. It would appear then that the two record labels that signed and launched Laurel Canyon's first two folk rock bands were not only major record labels, and what's the chances of that, but also happened to be corporate entities that had deep ties to the nation's center of power. With Laurel Canyon's other bands as well, it was the major record labels, not upstart independents like you find with Motown, like you find with Philly International, like you find with uh, uh, Stax, like you find with all these other companies. Independents, independent labels start guys off. Then you get a major labor deal. Not in Laurel Canyon. Laurel Canyon, you skip the middle manion. And you go right to getting that bag from the major labels. Let's read on. With Laurel Canyon's other bands as well. It was the major record labels, not upstart independents labels. Not upstart independent labels that signed the new artists. <clears throat> it was the major labels that provided them with instruments and amplifiers. It was the major labels that provided them with studio time and session musicians. It was the major labels that released and then heavily promoted those albums. As Unterberger duly notes in his expansive two-volume review of the folk rock movement, Quote, much folk rock was recorded and issued by huge corporations and broadcast over radio and television stations owned for the most part by the same or similar pillars of the establishment. 
close quotes. The corporate titans of all three branches of the mainstream media, print, radio, and television, those corporate titans did their part to help out the titans of the record industry. Unterberger notes that AM radio and sometimes primetime network television would act as a primary conduit for this countercultural expression. Conservative, corporate-controlled AM stations across the country almost immediately began giving serious airplay to the new sounds coming out of Southern California, and network television gave the rising stars unprecedented coverage and exposure. Primetime variety hours were much more likely to showcase rock acts than they would be in subsequent decades. New releases by the birds were often accompanied by large ads in trade magazines that simultaneously plugged the records and upcoming TV appearances. The boys in Buffalo Springfield, for example, managed to find themselves appearing as guests on an impressive array of network television shows, including American Bandstand, The Smothers Brothers Show. Yeah, that was a real show. I know the nieces and nephews was like, what was y'all on? Yes, The Smothers Brothers. Their last name was Smothers. That's the only way that, that would make any sense, right? <laughs> Anyway, Shebang, the Della Reese show, Detroit's own Della Reese from Black Bottom, Detroit. The Go Show, the Andy Williams show, Hollywood Palace, where the action is, Joy Bishop's late night show, and a local program known as Boss City. Boss. Boos. They also made guest appearances, curiously enough, on primetime hits like Mannix and The Gift from Uncle. And he's manufactured too, Rick Ross manufactured. The print media did its part as well to raise awareness of the new music countercultural scene. In September 1965, the nation's premier Newsweekly's Time and Newsweek ran virtually simultaneous stories on the folk rock's craze. On the folk rock craze just months after the first folk rock release had climbed to the top of the charts. Okay, now hold on. we got to say something here. This is what they do when they mean for a particular music to take over. Think about that now. It's not what they did with other newer music genres until gangster rap became a, a, a sublet of the larger genre. When hip hop came out, they didn't do this. Major labels wasn't touching it with a 10 foot pole, they had to go through the chitlin circuit and all of that. And it wasn't, you know, after, after much resistance, mainstream American pop culture began to open up somewhat. Then they did the old switcheroo, the bait and switch game, and inserted gangster rap in. To where people confuse gangster rap and, and you know, consider it to be hip hop. It's all hip hop, you know, uh, or rather, it's all gangster rap to some people. But here, 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 you clearly see when a when the powers that be want a particular music to be promoted, that they have for a long time had machinery in place to make sure that that music is promoted. Okay, I just wanted to say that. Okay, let's move on because it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. I hate to keep losing them. I'm not going to say another word till I finish this. Okay, anyway. A month later, on July 25th, the band landed the opening slot on the most anticipated concert of the year. The Rolling Stones show at the Hollywood Bowl, sponsored by local radio station KHJ. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. 
long page. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Um, they also made guest appearances, curiously enough, on primetime hits like Mannix and the Gift and the Girl from Uncle. Okay. The print media did its part as well to raise awareness of the new music countercultural scene. In September 1965, the nation's premier news weeklies, Time and Newsweek, ran virtually simultaneous stories on the folk rock craze. Just months after the first folk rock release had climbed to the top of the charts. The country's biggest daily newspapers chimed in as well, providing an inordinate amount of coverage of the emerging scene. By the end of 1967, the movement had its very own publication, Rolling Stone. Initially designed to look as though it were a part of the underground press, talk about it. Initially designed to look as though it were a part of the underground press, or a product of the underground press, it was without question very much a corporate mouthpiece. Another avenue of the print media provided the scene with considerable exposure as well. As Inerson notes, many of the Laurel Canyon stars, particularly members of Buffalo Springfield and the Monkees, were, quote, the darlings of the California teen magazines, including teen set, teen screen, and tiger beat. In 1964, just months before the birth of folk rock, the L.A. Free Press, widely believed to be the first underground newspaper of the 1960s, was launched from offices at the corner of Sunset and Crescent Heights at the very mouth of Laurel Canyon. How fitting. The publication, which quickly became the voice of the canyon, was initially financed by comedian Steve Allen. Interesting. In the late 1960s, it was purchased and killed off by pornographer Larry Flint. As the story is usually told, the 1960s countercultural movement posed a rather serious threat to the status quo. But if that were truly the case, then why was it the pillars of the establishment? Come on, talk about it. I know what he's about to say. Then why was it? The pillars of, a of the establishment, uh, but if that were truly the case, then why was it the pillars of the establishment, to use Unterberger's words, that initially launched the movement? The pillars of the establishment launched this counter-establishment movement. Sounds like problem, reaction, solution, Hegelian Dialect 101. Why was it the man that signed and recorded these artists? I mean, the man. Stick it to the man, dude. That man. Why was it the man that signed and recorded these artists? And that heavily promoted them on the radio, on television, and in print. And that set them up. Why was it the man that set them up with their very own radio station and their very own monthly magazine, Rolling Stone? <laughs> It could be argued, I suppose, that this was simply a case of corporate America doing what it does best, making a profit off of anything and everything. Blinded by greed, a devil's advocate might say the corporate titans inadvertently created a monster. That's what the super skeptical, follow the money, truther guys say. That's only going to take you so far. Because the higher up the, the, higher up the pyramid you go, the higher in degrees you go, the less it's about money. The family's up at the top of that been had money. They want control and domination. Blinded by, okay, the question that is begged by the, okay, blinded by greed, a devil's advocate might say the corporate titans inadvertently created a monster. The question that is begged by that explanation, however, is why, after it had become abundantly clear that a monster had allegedly been created, 
Why was nothing done to stop the growth of that monster? Why, for example, did the state not utilize its law enforcement and criminal justice powers to silence some of the most prominent countercultural voices? None of these people got Bob Marley, right? All these, all these old dudes was, was cool except for the ones that wasn't. And they got took care of by the coven. It's not as if it would have required resorting to heavy-handed measures since many of the Laurel Canyon stars were openly using, dealing, or at least advocating the use of illegal substances they were practically begging for the powers that be to take action. If they were really anti-establishment, the powers that be could have suicided the whole lot of them. Simply saying, oh, you know, uh, oh, something happened to uh, Crosby. You know, he spoke out a lot against us, but unfortunately, he couldn't stop the use of illicit drugs such as LSD. And he had a bad trip and died. They could have offed all of those guys if those guys were a threat. Okay. And yet that never happened. As just one example, three members of Buffalo Springfield, Neil Young, Richie Fure, and Jim Messina, along with a dozen others, including Eric Clapton, were arrested in a drug bust at a Topanga Canyon home, only to then walk away, as if nothing had happened. Why wasn't this case, and so many others like it, aggressively prosecuted? David Crosby has candidly acknowledged that the DEA could have popped me for interstate transport of dope or deal and reconnection is successful so once again david crosby has candidly acknowledged that the dea that quote the dea could have popped me for interstate transport of dope or dealing lots of times and never did john phillips busted for wholesale trafficking of pharmaceutical uh, busted for wholesale trafficking of pharmaceuticals was by his own account quote looking at 45 years and got 30 days close quote he began serving his sentence on april 20th appropriately enough and served just 24 days in a minimum security prison that offered residents quote unquote such activities as basketball aerobics softball tennis archery and golf and that featured a delicious kosher kitchen an elaborate salad bar and a tasty brunch on Sundays. Time and time again, the man was handed golden opportunities to crack down on Laurel Canyon's most prominent voices. And time and time again, those dangerous dissidents were handled with kid gloves. Indeed, the LAPD appears to have adopted a hands-off policy toward the Laurel Canyon crowd. As musician turned photographer Henry Diltz acknowledged to writer Harvey Kubernick, there was not a presence of the heat in Laurel Canyon. The heat meaning the fuzz, 12, 5 Radio personality Elliot Mintz agreed, noting that he couldn't recall a law enforcement presence in Laurel Canyon. Given the unique geography of the Canyon community, it would have been very easy for the police to cut off access and conduct regular sweeps, but nothing like that ever happened. Instead, police seemed to have stayed out of the Canyon entirely. The state had another powerful tool at its disposal to silence young critics in voluntary military service. There was, after all, a war going on, and hundreds of thousands of draft-age young men across the country were being fed into the war machine. As Richie Unterberger noted in Turn, 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 quote, Most folk rockers, if they were male, 
Oh, turn, turn, turn the book. Quote from the book. Quote, most folk rockers, if they were male, like their audience, were of draft age. But curiously enough, very, very few had their careers interrupted by the draft. Close quote. Actually, Unterberger appears to have been playing it safe with the very, very few wording. Since the reality is that none of the folks living the rock and roll life in the canyons, whether folk rockers, country rockers, or psychedelic rockers, had their careers interrupted by the Vietnam War. The literature is littered with mentions of various rock stars receiving their draft notices, but those mentions are invariably followed by amusing anecdotes about how said people fooled the draft board by pretending to be gay, or pretending to be crazy, or pretending to be otherwise unfit for service. Of course, if it had really been that easy to pull the wool over the draft board's eyes, then Uncle Sam probably wouldn't have been able to come up with all those bodies to send over to Vietnam. In other words, everybody would have been making those same excuses. But when they asked this Laurel Canyon crowd, who again, remember, they're supposed to be the rebels, right? They're supposed to be revolutionaries, agents for change, counterculture. How come they didn't do them like they did Muhammad Ali? So they were able to dodge the draft successfully and dodge jail successfully other draft dodgers not so not so not so lucky okay the literature is littered with mentions of various rock stars receiving their draft notice oh, okay 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 the reality is that thousands of young men across the country tried those very same tricks but they only ever seemed to work for the laurel canyon crowd how is it possible that not one of the musical icons of the Woodstock generation, almost all of them draft age males, not one of them, was shipped off to slog through the rice paddies of Vietnam? Should we just consider that, that that's just another one of those great serendipities? Was it mere luck that kept all the Laurel Canyon stars out of jail and out of the military during the turbulent decade that was the 1960s, not likely. The reality is that the establishment, as it was known in those days, had the power to prevent the musical icons of the 1960s from ever becoming the megastars that they became. The state, working hand in hand with corporate America, could quite easily have prevented the entire countercultural movement from ever getting off the ground because then, as now, the state controlled the channels of communication. A real grassroots cultural revolution would probably have involved a bunch of starving musicians barely scratching out a living, playing tiny coffee shops in the hopes of maybe someday landing a record deal with some tiny independent label and then just maybe if they got really lucky getting a little airplay on some obscure college radio stations but that's not how the 60s folk rock revolution played out not by any stretch of the imagination and I used to always wonder how is this revolution televised that's what Gil Scott Heron and them was talking about I used to wonder that as a kid like wow if it was such a revolution against whatever the establishment Either they changed things so they didn't have to continue with the revolution or things changed them. And instead of trying to beat the powers that be or trying to beat the establishment, they were actually trying to join them. And they have a beloved name. They have fans and people that, oh yeah, you know, oh my goodness, you guys, you guys were the music of my youth. And David Crosby, I mean, I wonder what goes through his mind when he hears somebody tell him something like that. 
You idiot. You gullible sheeple. Because you know they see us with great disdain. But anyway, okay. And now, without further ado, let's circle back around and take a look at the Buffalo Springfield story from the beginning, starting from January 3rd, 1945, when Stephen Arthur Steeles was born to William and Talitha Steeles. As John Ineson recounts for... Um, recounts in the book for what it's worth Stephen's roots were quote firmly planted in southern soil his family traces its history back to the plantations of the rural antebellum south after the Union armies laid waste to, mu to much of the southern farm economy their family relocated to Illinois Ineson describes William Steeles as somewhat as quote somewhat of a soldier of fortune, an engineer, builder, and dreamer who frequently uprooted the family to follow his dreams and schemes, close quote. That is, I, su I suppose, as good a definition as any for what he actually appears to have been, a military intelligence operative who was frequently on assignment in various hotspots in Central America. Stephen's childhood was spent in Illinois, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and various parts of Central America, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, and the Panama Canal Zone. At a fairly young age, Steeles attended the Admiral Farragut Military Academy in St. Petersburg, Florida. In later years, his authoritarian manner and military bearing would earn him the nickname The Sarge. He joined his first band, the Radars, as a drummer. In his next band, the Continentals, he played guitar alongside another young guitarist named Don Felder, who would later turn up in Laurel Canyon as a member of the Eagles, because as we have seen repeatedly, all roads seemed to lead to Laurel Canyon. According to Einerson, quote, an unfortunate incident with the administration at his Tampa Bay High School resulted in Stevens' dismissal in 1961, after which he joined his wayward family, then settled in Costa Rica, close quote. What that unfortunate incident may have been, and why he had been separated from his family at a fairly young age, remains a mystery. In any event, Stephen's next few years are rather murky. Some reports have him graduating from a high school in the Panama Canal Zone. Others have him shuffling back and forth between Florida and Central America. Stills himself has, as previously noted, at times claimed that he served a stint in Vietnam. Whatever the case, circa March of 1964, he surfaced in New Orleans with his sights set on a career in music. By the summer of 1964, he had drifted to New York's Greenwich Village where he became fast friends with a young folk singer-songwriter by the name of Peter Torkelson, who like so many others in this story, hailed from Washington, D.C. The two played together briefly as a duo before Torkelson migrated to Connecticut, then Venezuela, which was, I suppose, a typical migratory route for folkies in those days. Folkies with money, folkies not brokies. Torkelson would soon enough make his way to Laurel Canyon, where he would become monkey Peter Tork. Stills would also audition for the show, but his bad teeth and thinning hair would render him unfit for a leading role on primetime TV. In July 1964, Stills found work as one of the nine members of the All Go Go Singers, the newly formed band for New York's famed cafe All Go Go. Singing alongside of Stills was a young folky named Richie Furey, the son of a pharmacist 
who had run a family drugstore in Yellow Springs, Ohio. By November 1964, the Algogo Singers already had an album out, but trouble soon arose due primarily to the fact that the band was under contract to Morris Levy, a known organized crime figure who would soon be indicted on an array of criminal charges. The band soon broke up and Furet headed off to Connecticut where a cousin got him a job at Pratt & Whitney. While working there, he took a little time off to audition for a slot in the Chadwell Mitchell Trio, but he was beat out by a military brat from Roswell named John Duschendorf, who would later be known as, y'all remember, John Denver. Stephen Stills, meanwhile, hung out in New York for a while longer before heeding the call of the Pied Piper and heading out to L.A. in August of 1965. The Piper is calling him to join him. That was the summer, according to Einerson, that the epicenter of American rock and roll shifted coasts. Los Angeles replacing New York as the power base of the music industry. Richie Ferre apparently soon found himself missing Stills but didn't know how to reach his former sidekick. So, he sent a letter to Steele's dad in El Salvador. According to legend, and William Steele's forwarded the message to Stephen. What exactly the elder Steele's, William Steele's, was doing in El Salvador circa 1965-66 is unknown, but former State Department official William Bloom provided some possible clues in his authoritative Killing Hope book. Ready? Quote, Throughout the 1960s, multifarious American experts occupied themselves in El Salvador by enlarging and refining the state's security and counterinsurgency, and counterinsurgency apparatus, the police, enlarging and refining the police, the National Guard, the state security and counterinsurgency apparatus, the military, the communications and intelligence networks, the coordination with their counterparts in other Central American countries. As matters turned out, these were the forces and resources which were brought into action to impose widespread repression and wage war. Close quote. Meanwhile, up in Canada, Neil Young and Bruce Palmer were handling guitar and bass duties for the Minor Birds. That's the one Rick James was in. Neil Percival Kenneth Raglan Young. That's enough names. Neil, Neil Percival Kenneth Raglan Young was born on November 12, 1945 in Toronto to Scott Young, a sports writer and novelist and Edna Rassi Ragland, a Canadian television personality. So they were both celebrities, basically. Doing well. Sports writer is a celebrity to sports fans. Scott Young had spent a conserv uh, Scott Young had spent a considerable amount of time abroad during World War II first as a journalist and then as a member of the Royal Canadian Navy. Scott's father, Neil's grandfather, like Richie Furries, had been a pharmacist, drugstore owner. As Einerson recounts, quote, Neil Young and Stephen Stills had more in common than music. Both had grown up in transient families. Neil's journalist father, Scott, uprooting his mother, Edna, an older brother Bob several times during Neil's first 15 years. Close quote. Novelists, it would appear, need to move around a lot. Uh, that's a good loose job to call your operative. He's a, nov he's a novelist. That's why, you know, you might find him in Costa Rica one day, and then the next day you might find him in Belize, and then, lo and behold, you look up and he's in Leningrad, so... 
you know, he he has to have a wide range of experiences to draw from so he can write great stories. <laughs> That's a good cover. Oh, the CIA, you guys. You guys. You guys. Okay. Just after his 17th birthday, Neil Young formed his first band, The Squires, and began playing local gigs. According to legend, it was during those early years that Young and Steele's first briefly crossed paths up in Canada. That meeting would, a couple of years later, allegedly send Young and Palmer, also born in Toronto, to a violinist father, an artist mother, off on a cross-country quest to find Stephen Stills. The Minor Birds also at one time featured Nick St. Nicholas. Yeah, I'm not making that up. Featured Nick St. Nicholas, duality much, and Goldie McJohn. That's Project Janice. Mwah. Oh, magnifique. Excellent job with Project Genesis name. Oh, say magnifique. Featured Nick St. Nicholas and Goldie McJohn, both of whom would become members of Steppenwolf. And this Steppenwolf. I like that song. I don't know what he's talking about, though. It's like he's about half drunk. I like it though. It's a bop. In all the intertwined characters in the preceding narrative, Stephen Stills, Richie Furry, Neil Young, Bruce Palmer, John Denver, Don Felder, Nick St. Nicholas, Goldie McJohn, and Peter Tork would soon find themselves transplanted to Laurel Canyon. When I was a young boy, he said they better leave this one alone because he was bad. Bad. I wonder what blue singer did he steal that from. And that has concluded tonight's reading. We are now on chapter fifteen, Beyond Buffalo Springfield, and the Muff and the Monkeys too. Chapter fifteen. Is called Beyond Buffalo Springfield and the Monkeys too. So keep that in mind. We'll come back next time um, for the next reading. Again, I'll announce. I'll let you know when it's coming. Tomorrow night, Days of Noah and prayer requests. So it won't be tomorrow night. But it's coming up, coming up soon, okay? So we give folks time to listen to this one. And there will be another one up before you know it. Uh, again, uh, thanks to the folks who are fasting along with us. The fast, again, we're our, the uh, uh, focus scripture. For the fast is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct their path. It is one of, it is, it is one of my favorite scriptures. <clears throat> And a prayer that I pray for myself often, but because of the uh, benefit of fasting always being, and again a spiritual fast anyway, always being that one is uh, uh, muting the flesh and amplifying the spirit, we want to be able to not miss the Lord's directions. By making a mistake hearing from the flesh thinking that we're hearing from the spirit it happens to human beings all the time this is one way to uh, minimize the chances of that happening and to just get more in tune with hearing the instructions of the Lord because his plans for you they shall not fail he has a perfect will for your life he allows you to do a lot of things within his permissive will for you but he has a perfect will so let's tune in and see what it is that the Lord 
has uh, in, in store for us according to his perfect will for this season in your life. Is that simple enough? We don't have to complicate it. So that's what that's what we're doing. You can join in if you want to. We began Monday, which which was pardon me, which was today when I started the broadcast. I've been up beginning the hiccups. And it's water only. It's water only. So Yep. I'm as full of water as the soda dispenser at a janky restaurant. That's a lot of water in the soda part. So, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. And it's easier to lean not to your own understanding when you're understanding what it is that the Lord wants you to do. So, that's that. Another four hours. Y'all trying to kill me. Okay, so now when I go over here to the podcast um, area, I expect y'all come with me. Because nobody's going to sit around this long except for you guys and podcast listeners. And you guys are so very unique, fearfully and wonderfully made, and show enough peculiar people. And I love you and can't get enough of you. Thank you so much for joining in here tonight. And again, join us tomorrow. Uh, I forgot what time me and Dave said, but it'll be posted up. Um, it'll be posted up and ready and whatnot. It's going to be on Dave's sh- channel. So we're going to meet at Dave's house. And y'all know how we usually do. After we get through partying at Dave's house and eating up all his snacks and drinking all of his Kool-Aid, then we get in the car and go over to my house and do the same. So, after days of Noah live stream, y'all can get with me. And please explain things to uh, to the slow and not for show. Um, and I'll check y'all tomorrow because it's about time I get on out this dome. Thank you so much. Uh, Cookie Crunch just say thumbs up if you enjoyed the show. Yes, indeed. Uh, oh, and also, beloved, while y'all listening, Unplug em, Unplug em channel <laughs> is not a favorite of YouTube. So they unsubscribe people and they're playing all kind of games, especially now that I'm at the cusp of 75,000. I don't care. They don't give you no extra nothing for reaching 75,000 viewers. But I just, you know... When somebody trying to run some type of game on me, I just like to try to beat them if I can. So this is what I'm going to ask that you do. Look and see if you've been un- unsubscribed because that's the game they're playing. Uh, one day I'm at 75,001. <laughs> and then the day I'm at 74,998. And, you know, but like it's been it's been like that since I crossed 75,000 last week so i think it's because advertisers begin to uh uh, uh write your emails and um want to sell space on your channel and uh, you know that's more revenue is more provision and if they can mess with that they can usually control people so that's 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 what's going on so yes please do if you're able just please check it out just make sure you just make sure you didn't get unsubscribed if you didn't want to subscribe before, I'm not asking you to, to subscribe now. But if you are a subscriber, don't let them run that game on you or me. So, check that out. All right, y'all? So, um, thank you again for listening. I thank you for your attention span. And I thank you for your participation. We enjoy these together. Okay? Okay. Um, did y'all want to maybe play a little 
Well, we're coming out of here. And if y'all want to join me for just a little short, maybe an hour of power, just an hour of power, um, just some praise and worship music, just for an hour. I'm not going to teach. I'm not going to do, do none of that. Save all that for tomorrow. How much talking you think one person can do in one sitting? I got up from here after them eight hours. <laughs> the other day, I went eight hours. I didn't even get up and go to the bathroom. When I got up from here, my knees and joints and everything was sounding like old school cereal. Snap, crackling, and popping. Yeah. They actually have a... This is real. She-Hulk is real. I thought that was a joke. Okay. I'm through. I'm through. I'm through. I'm through. Look like Shrek girlfriend. Anyway. I forgot what I was saying. Okay. All right. Okay. Chocolate E. Less Ride said yes. And she's... And, is Chocolate E. Less Ride? What you do have half a day? She here early? The bird's not tweeting or nothing. And Chocolate E. Let's Ride is here. Well, this is a special occasion. So, yes, y'all y'all come on back. Just give me about two minutes. And I mean it, two minutes now. No, no longer than that because, you know, black folks, two minutes is five minutes. So let me just tell y'all this. Come back in 60 seconds. In 60 seconds, we'll be ready to do another one. Just praise and worship. All right, y'all. Peace. Love, peace. And coconut oil grease. Do, 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 do. Do, do. Do, 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 do. Do, do. Good night.